All right. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be hosting tonight. And uh, we're tonight, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period. And our speaker, Ian Thomas of America Walks, will speak for up to about an hour. Then we'll have a question and answer period for usually the last little while. And then after that, we'll each get a chance to do our infamous rebuttal periods. We generally shut down the thing about nine o'clock or so in the evening. So if you're ready, uh, we can start entertaining announcements for the good of the uh, club and, and I mean, the college. And uh, oh, yes, there's two rules at the college. One is no personal attacks and two is one fool at a time. All right, Charlie, if you're ready, we'll start with our announcements. All right, everybody. Welcome to meeting number 3,648 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, this will only take about a minute or uh, so, but I'd like to recommend all of you join our Google group, Google email group, or our meetup group in order to get uh, announcements for the meeting, upcoming meetings. Uh, please do so, it's simple. And instructions are there at the top and center of our website. Okay, uh, also before I forget, the um, we have three open dates. And these are in April, April 2nd, 16th, and 23rd. And we're scheduling uh, a special Earth Day series of speakers. So if you were looking uh, primarily to get ecological environmental topics during the month, we're not restricted to that, but that's our focus. So three open dates uh, are, uh, if you'd like to speak or can recommend an organization we should invite. Okay, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Next week on January 15th, the Libertarian Party will be returning. Uh, their secretary, State Secretary Justin Tucker, taking an amusing approach, uh, trying to convince us to become libertarians and not like government. January 22nd, an entirely new group that is seeking to establish a just, just society, J-U-S-T society will be here. On January 29th, an interesting program, the farm workers, tomato pickers, and the bilingual program uh, should be a very good program on labor issues. On February the 5th, we will learn what is wrong with the Democratic Party. We could be here all night with that one. Yeah, they gotta stop stealing elections maybe. February 5th though, should be a good one. Uh, February 12th, the Illinois Green Party, which I am affiliated, will be speaking on how to do your own referendums uh, and ballot issues, uh, citizens initiatives, uh, such as walkability of your neighborhood. You could put it on the ballot. Um, on February the 12th, we're gonna be talking about foreign affairs and the United States war on Venezuela. It's been in the news quite a bit and a topic of the country has been a topic of significant destruction. On March the 5th, our own Dan Weinberg. I forgot the one he searched, Charlie. Oh, uh, February 26th, thank you. Uh, we're gonna look at the topic of high tech driving. Um, these are autonomous vehicles running around your neighborhood, buses and take the your autonomous vehicle to work, program it. Okay, that's February out of the way. March 5th again, Dan Weinberg will be covering various food and water issues. He's got some concerns that there's limitations on each and what we can do to preclude shortages from happening. On March the 12th, again, we're gonna cover foreign affairs, this time 
It's going to be the, the war on Nicaragua. Los Sandinistas. Los Sandinistas. Okay, that's on February 26th. And um, let's see, we flip to, how do we do this? Oh, yeah. March 19th. Uh, we're going to have a gentleman. He's an author. He's going to, he's got to wrote a political memoir and most intriguing. He has written a manifesto. There's nothing I like better than a manifesto. On March 26th, Jian Lee, who's spoken before, very good talks. We'll be talking about the yin yang dynamism that's operative in the world and your worldview, which might need adjusting. On, uh, on March, whoops, where, where am I at? March or April the 9th, I got a little mixed up here. Uh, no, we're going to April then. On April the 9th uh, will be the One Earth Collective. And they put on a film series, an or a Chicago-based organization which has not been to the college. So join us if you believe that there is one earth that we need to care for. And finally, on April the 30th, yours truly will be discussing the proof, I have proof that there is a primitive species living in the forest of the United States. And therefore we need to establish um, preserves we have to preserve the forest habitat a lot on the uh, lumber industry will be there. And one last thing, I put an email out to some of you. I was thinking of sponsoring one that, a movie that anybody could watch free on their own at any time during a month. So we would have a monthly movie. I don't know if we'd ever have a discussion group, but uh, Contact me if you're interested. It's simply that the college would have one movie a month that we would recommend uh, from the many that are out there that are free and online and something you could either schedule, maybe it's scheduled to be viewed or uh, viewable on all time. We have a YouTube page that we could post these. Uh, so you could, that's what I was thinking. But if you'd like to get involved in this little project, um, sometimes we have speakers who want to show a movie. And I say, we simply don't have time for it. And this will fill that niche, so to speak. So we would have a permanent collection of, of movies. OK, that's it. Thank you very much. Take it away, Tim. All right, um, our speaker is uh... Is, if, if Ian Thomas is ready to go, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, take whatever time you need to do and speak. And uh, if you got a PowerPoint, go ahead and share it now. And I ask everybody again to mute during the presentation part of it. And we'll at, the, at the some point during the uh, presentation, when we get into our Q&A, you'll be able to read. Um, do it. But let's give our speaker our time. And uh, Ian, please take it away. Yeah, thanks so much, Tim, Charles, everybody. It's a great pleasure. To, uh, to, to meet with you this evening and uh, talk about America Walks and our vision of a walkable America. Um, I do wanna just say, I had assumed this was gonna be about a one hour session um, and I can stay a little bit after seven o'clock uh, if there are still questions at that point, but I'm not gonna be able to stay much later than about 7.15. Uh, just FYI. Um, so we had a good discussion before the formal uh, into what a walkable community was. Um, Michael mentioned 20 minute neighborhoods, this concept of having most of your usual uh, destinations and services and needs within a 20 minute walk. Um, that was how um, cities all over the world were designed until the automobile came along in the early part of the last century. And, um, you know, all over the world as well, uh, the automobile has reshaped cities in, in really a very negative way. And I think none more so than the United States of America, where the automobile really is seen as king. 
Um, so America Walks exists to try to reverse as many as possible of those changes and get us back to situations where people can build walking into their daily routines. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our organization and then talk about walking programs, which we encourage as a way for people to get you know, engaged in the idea of walking, because so many people hardly walk at all in the United States these days. You look at the CDC uh, data on physical activity, uh, and, and it's really shocking how little so many people walk. Some people walk a lot, but it's a minority. So walking programs we see as a sort of an entry point to becoming advocates for policies and uh, community design changes that make places walkable. I'm going to give you three specific success stories, one from a big city, one from a small rural community, and one from the town where I live, which I consider to be a mid-sized college town, Columbia, Missouri. And then I've got some illustrations about how do you take a, what, uh, uh, my colleague Charles Marone uh, of Strong Towns calls a strode, which is the um, wide, fast, uh, major arterial that also has an enormous number of driveways and entrances into commercial um, uh, stores and large parking lots and large apartment complexes and so on. How do you take that streetscape and turn it into a, uh, a real street, a neighborhood street that you can walk down uh, safely and enjoyably. So America Walks is a 24 year old um, national ed education and advocacy organization. 1997, we were established. Um, we're primarily a communications program. That's really what we do. We do a lot of communications. About 44,000 people all across the US are signed up as subscribers. That means they receive our uh, monthly email newsletters. They get our social media. Uh, they Many of them attend our webinars and uh, participate in um, uh, uh, various online uh, workshops and so on. Uh, you can become an America Walks subscriber if you're not already by simply going to to americawalks.org and signing up to be a subscriber. It doesn't cost anything. You'll just start receiving our, our emails initially. And if you want to follow us on um, Facebook and so on, you can also do that. Um, we have about 44,000 subscribers, as I mentioned, all across the United States. And our goal is to build their capacity to make changes in their communities by providing uh, training, best practices, a network of, of peers and supporters uh, as part of a sort of a national movement to, to change uh, communities. So we work in two ways. Um, we encourage walking programs um, and we engage people through communications and education about walking. Uh, and when people become engaged, we then encourage them to become advocates for those more challenging policy, public funding and infrastructure changes that need to happen in order to make a community walkable. And we do this in a number of different ways. This is, these are some examples of our webinars. All of our webinars are free of charge. Uh, we have one or two a month, uh, bring in um, experts in particular areas of community design, transportation planning and so on housing um, uh, and also showcase best practices where um, some uh, initiatives are successful uh, sharing those ideas uh, and again if you just sign up at americawalks.org you will receive the announcements about our about our webinars the walking college and i'm struck by the fact that we have a walking college and you are the college of complexes um and and one of you asked if we're a car if, if i'm associated with a college in a sense i am this is our more in-depth training program every year we recruit about 25 to 30 very committed advocates from all over the country to sign up for the online training which we call the walking college uh, we require about five to 10 hours 
of study uh, from each of these individuals every week. Um, they uh, read online articles that are part of our curriculum. They take part in online Zoom uh, discussion sessions. They are given community assignments to accomplish in their own community. And by the end of the course, which lasts about six months, they have to write a walking action plan, which is their personal plan, or if they work with an organization um, such as the Active Transportation Alliance, which some of you may be familiar with, that's the main walkable community group in Chicago. Um, if they're part of that, it might be part of the strategic plan for the organization. And um, they, they then endeavor to uh, implement that plan over the coming years. We do a lot of workshops, or at least before the pandemic, we used to do a lot of workshops uh, in person. Um, in particular, trying to work with state departments of transportation and state departments of health. Um, the main problem for creating walkable communities is state DOTs, Illinois DOT, Missouri DOT, and so on. Um, and departments of health have a vision for a healthy community, which obviously involves walking. It's the easiest way to get exercises. So we have been quite successful by organizing collaborative workshops in which the DOT and the Department of Health come together to look at the um, areas that they agree on. And generally the outcome is that some of the DOT administrators and planners and engineers realize that creating walkable communities, slowing down the cars is very beneficial for those communities. And we hope then that those two agencies will work closer together in the state to enact policies and programs that create more walkable communities. We do a um, panel discussion series online called Walking Towards Justice. This is an occasional series, one or two episodes per year. Uh, it's focused on a justice or equity issue that can be tied to the design of communities, housing, um, safety uh, from police uh, uh, officers, um, the ability to have free mobility within your community. And we usually tie it to a, um, to a book study uh, to, to um, and, and sometimes try to get the author on the panel. And before the pandemic hit, we used to hold a, um, a national walking summit, which was an in-person conference. Uh, we, we have had as many as uh, 600 people attending our national walking summit, uh, a three or four day um, conference uh, uh, with um, breakout sessions and keynote speakers and so on. So that's America Walks. Uh, let's talk about the benefits of walking. This uh, slide comes from our partner organization, Walk to Connect, uh, who really emphasize the practice of walking uh, and talk about all of these incredible benefits that individual human beings uh, um, benefit from uh, if they walk regularly. Uh, from physical health to emotional health to building community to supporting a healthy environment. So um, we want to start with the benefits of walking. Uh, and I know you all understand that because I heard it. Everybody understands that. Almost everybody you talk to realizes it's good to walk. It's enjoyable to walk. It's healthy to walk. And everybody says, gosh, I wish I walked more. And personal failing on their own individual part. But it's not really. In most cases, it's a systemic problem because the places they live, work, and play do not encourage walking, are not safe for walking, are not enjoyable for walking. However, walking is, is the thing to do. And I'm just gonna run through a lot of different ways to walk. We can have walking school buses for young kids so that kids walk to school. Uh, back in the 1960s, more than half of all American children walked to school. Now it's about 10%. Uh, we do believe those numbers are starting to come up again because of safe routes to school and walking school bus programs, but it's an important place 
to invest uh, efforts and energy, getting kids walking to school so that they have that habit instead of thinking that every journey involves getting into a vehicle. Senior citizens uh, walk, um, and it's so important for senior citizens, both physical and mental health, to walk frequently. Walk with a Dark is a great program. Um, in which uh, uh, physicians sign up as uh, community leaders, leading walks, inviting their patients and other community residents to walk with them and to model that healthy behavior. We have walks for uh, historic and spiritual purposes, such as the Camino de Santiago uh, in Spain. We can have crazy walks, glow-in-the-dark dance walks, and we can do walk audits. And a walk audit, this is where we're going to transition from walking to walkability or walkable communities. A walk audit is a walk where you pay attention to whether it is safe and enjoyable and inviting to go for a walk. This is uh, Quebec Street, uh, the Quebec Street underpass under Interstate 70 in Denver, Colorado. And believe it or not, on one side of this uh, interstate, there is a uh, low-income housing uh, development, and on the other side are a lot of restaurants and, um, and hotels where residents from that community live. And this is their commute because the state DOT didn't think it was important to put a sidewalk in. When you do a walk audit, um, you observe the conditions and make notes, and you can either then um turn them in to your local city as part of an advocacy campaign or you can build up an entire analysis of your presentation later as you try to work with public officials to change the policies and the funding and the and and eventually the design of the community to make it more walkable so walkable communities are these places where people walk where it's enjoyable and safe to walk, where there's traffic, but the traffic behaves in a reasonable way so that it does not interfere with pedestrians' enjoyment of walking. And that means good sidewalks, good frequent crosswalks. It means the traffic goes slowly, and that's a result of design. Um, and it also means lots of destinations within walking distance which, as I mentioned when we were just chatting before the program started, is dependent on a lot of people living in that area not owning a car. Because if you look at the amount of space it takes to store cars, if everybody owns a car, then there's too much space taken up by cars, and it's too far to walk to the nearest grocery store, for example. Uh, benefits of walkable communities. This was a uh, workshop I did in Montana a number of years ago, and they identified all of these um, benefits, equity, and I think I'm going to, yeah, so uh, we created a, a statement about why walkable communities uh, supported all of these benefits, uh, and I'm just going to show a couple of them. There's equity, I'm not going to read it, but you can see it down the bottom of the screen there, and economic vitality, and it's really interesting looking at economic vitality. Uh, and again, we discussed this uh, just before. It was a great conversation that first 10 minutes before we got started. We used to have lots of, and now we don't. And we have one massive Home Depot or, or Walmart that you have to drive to. And not only is it, is it a driving-centric um, economy, um, all of that money is part, it's, it's sucked out of the community. It is a... Um, it, it, uh, uh, Instead of when you buy your hammer and nails from the local hardware uh, uh, store owner, that money stays in your community and he spends it at the grocery store and the grocery store owner spends it somewhere else and the money circulates. The car oriented, the driving centric uh, economy sucks money out of communities because all of those driving centric businesses like Walmart and Home Depot are, are investor owned and they have a an economic model that is designed to to squeeze every penny out of its workers and its customers so that the shareholders 
um, uh, um, you know, make great dividends out of their investment in that company. And it is also car oriented because um, it's built on large tracts of land, again, to drive down the, the uh, cost of everything and maximize the profits. So I'm going to get into my three success stories. First of all, we'll talk about the city of St. Louis, not too far from where I live um, here in Missouri. I'm going to introduce you to Faye Page Edwards. She was one of our Walking College fellows several years ago. She went through the training and um, developed her project uh, to, to work with her local uh, Girl Trek organization, which is a wonderful national organization, a partner with America Walks. It, it involves walking, take a walk, join the movement. Uh, and it's focused on African-American women and girls walking for self-empowerment. Uh, but through our partnership with Girl Trek, they are now also very interested in the advocacy beyond simply taking a walk uh, and building confidence and building empowerment. They want to change their neighborhoods. And, and Faye Page Edwards was a big part of that. She looked at the data and saw that speed kills. And uh, when vehicles are traveling at about 20 miles an hour, um, and they hit a pedestrian, then the likelihood that'll be a fatal collision is very small. Once you get up to 30, it's almost 50%, and you can see the other numbers there. We need to keep vehicles down to 20 miles an hour in neighborhoods so that if there is an accident, then it's not a fatal accident. And she recognized that speeding cars were threatening safety and quality of life in the neighborhoods of St. Louis. When she tried to get some traffic calming installed, she learned that there was a law on the books in the city of St. Louis that no uh, objects shall be placed within the public road right of way that would slow down traffic. This was going back to about the 70s when that was the thing. And um, fortunately, public opinion has changed and she worked very hard for a couple of years to get the St. Louis City Council to reverse that law, to pass a new law that said traffic calmings are not only allowed, but they're important, and to start a program uh, of traffic calming within the neighborhoods, which involved a lot of community engagement. Um, art was very much a part of it, and um, some uh, inexpensive materials to create traffic calming projects that slow down the traffic. These were sort of um, experiments, de uh, demonstration projects um, that were put together um, through the City of St. Louis program. Um, but the idea was if they were successful and if people liked them, then they would become permanent. Um, they did the uh, uh, analysis they slowed the speed down, you can see there, from over 30 miles an hour to uh, almost down to 15 miles an hour. Uh, they measured how many vehicles came to a complete stop at stop signs when there was these additional uh, structures uh, making it easier for pedestrians to cross the road. And in areas where they were successful, which was really all of them, um, they went ahead and installed permanent traffic calming, something that was not allowed beforehand. So that's our story from a big city. Now, what about a small rural town? I'm going to go down to uh, Batesville, Arkansas, and tell the story there, which has three main takeaways. Um, we discussed the impact of automobiles and sprawl on, on local businesses. And so one of the takeaways from this uh, story set in a small rural town is that automobile oriented sprawl and high vehicle speeds have caused the decline of rural main streets. Secondly, that small town mayors can be very effective champions for main street revitalization. And thirdly, that walkability improvements in rural downtown districts can catalyze economic development. So this is Batesville, Arkansas, town of about 10,000, 10 square miles. It is um, the oldest living city in the state of Arkansas. It's actually the second city that was established in, uh, in the 1810s, uh, but the first one 
went out of existence at some point since. So Batesville is the oldest living city. And the first time I visited Batesville, which was in 2014, this is what Main Street looked like. Um, wide uh, travel lanes uh, with a lot of speeding cars going through and a lot of empty uh, retail buildings. Uh, kind of a dead downtown. It's the county seat, so it has, uh, but basically uh, the only businesses downtown uh, service those uh, workers, those day workers, lunch, um, you know, uh, um, lunch cafeterias and so on. Um, and after about five o'clock, the whole place shuts down and it's absolutely dead. Um, in 2007, this guy was elected mayor, Rick Ellenbaugh. He was previously a, um, a physical education teacher in the school district. And he was very distressed by the fact that this small town was dying, that the young people that he coached uh, in the school district, they went away to college, they went away to get jobs in other cities, and they found things like vibrant downtowns, trail systems, lots of amenities, and they had no interest in coming back to Batesville. And he could see, he looked at the data, the average age of the town was going up and young people were not moving there and young people were leaving and not coming back. So he's still the mayor of Batesville now. He's been in that role for 15 years and uh, he's made it his mission to make Batesville a kind of place that young people like. Uh, and a um, big part of that was revitalizing downtown. The other character was uh, Bob Carius. Uh, he was the president of the um, Main Street Batesville organization, which is uh, um, a sort of an economic development organization. It's part of a national network, Main Street America, uh, focused on revitalizing the business district uh, of, of typically small uh, towns and he was a retired uh navy admiral uh and um uh kind of marshaled uh the amazing transformation that happened there so the first thing that um that mayor ellenbau and bob carius did was bring in this chap in the yellow hat and the green jacket his name is dan burden he is sometimes considered the uh, grandfather of the walking movement uh, he's been doing this work, visiting cities and towns and helping them become more walkable uh, since the 1980s. And I had the, the privilege of working with him on this project. And we went down there on a very cold uh, few days in February 2014. We did walk audits. We met with the community business leaders. We met with residents. We met with the schools and the hospitals. And we did several workshops and came up with some ideas for how to uh, improve walkability in Batesville. And a lot of these ideas have been done in other cities and Dan and I made presentations giving examples of those, but everything was bounced off the local residents and community leaders. And the plan that we ended up with was very much focused on what they were excited about. And we organized the plan into these different categories, what we want them to do in the first 100 days, what are the low hanging fruit that will move their transformation forward over the next maybe six to 12 months, and then some more mid-term mid and long-term uh, projects that, they sh that will take many years of planning and, and implementation. Um, the plan was given to them and um, we also gave them a graphic. So this picture was taken back in 2014 on Main Street in Batesville, uh, as it was at that time. Based on the ideas that they gave us and the plan, uh, we had a graphic designer create this picture of what this streetscape could look like if it was uh, if it was redesigned. And um, this is the same location with just some simple additions, some landscaping, some texture pavement. We've narrowed the driving lanes and we've put people into this graphic. And in fact, I'm going to go back and forth. If you look at the car right in the middle of the picture there with the headlights on, you can see that car is in both in both pictures. So 
This is the kind of transformation that we encouraged the Batesville uh, leaders to implement, to raise money for, to build public support for. It's not a lot of money. Uh, it really, it, 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 the whole transformation of five blocks, I think, ended up costing, um, really, and um, it, it did transform the city. They got working on it right away. They built support, they raised money, they wrote for grants, and they started rebuilding. And they reconfigured, so these are actual photographs. What I showed you before was a graphic, but these are actual photographs um, as they put lots of these landscaping planters in. They put lots of paint down, pedestrian crossings and stop bars and arrows. They put those parking spaces along the side of the street so it narrowed the lanes down. Um, they did those five uh, blocks. Um, they, they built in the landscaping. They got grants to improve the building facades and the sidewalks. The people's block was uh, one of the five blocks was entirely fundraised from the community. And that was, I think, something like $80,000 were raised from this town of 10,000 to, to pay for all the changes on that one block. They took vacant lots and existing public spaces and improved them, made them attractive recreational spaces or commercial spaces. This is a farmer's market here on the left. And there's a, um, a park that they improved uh, just behind Main Street where there's a beautiful creek that flows around. And the effect on the local economic development was remarkable. You remember uh, on the earlier slide, we saw that about 50% of the buildings, the, the commercial buildings were vacant in 2014. Within about two years, before the plan had even been fully implemented, uh, that vacancy rate was down to zero. There were new businesses in all of those vacant slots. There were new buildings being constructed and there was new residential construction going on with some of the upstairs spaces above the main street shops being um, being converted into apartments because developers knew that people wanted to live downtown now. They wanted to be downtown because the traffic calming and the streetscape improvements had made it uh, a place to be. And of course, property values and local taxes went up and the um, uh, um, and, and help sort of uh, finance those changes. This is the oldest building in Batesville, uh, built in 1903, and it had stood empty for decades uh, because everything had moved out of downtown um, as part of this kind of revitalization, which happened from 2014 to about 2018, the county library, which had previously been downtown and moved out to the edge, decided to move back downtown because now this was the place to be. And they invested over $3 million in renovating this uh, uh, dilapidated building, but still with the beautiful uh, architecture and the strong bones. And it's now become not just the library, but a number of nonprofit organizations have their offices there. And they're now having events downtown. Of course, the pandemic has impacted them as it has everybody else. But downtown has come alive. People are living there. Uh, people are, are uh, opening new businesses there. And people are walking there because it's now a walkable place. So I'm gonna move on to the third story now and focus on safety. Um, pedestrians die on America's streets at a shocking rate. And it, it's getting more shocking every year. The number of pedestrian deaths has increased by, uh, I think it's now over 60% in the last decade. Um, and it's not everybody affected equally. Most of the deaths occur in, uh, in or adjacent to low income neighborhoods. Uh, people on low income are more likely to be walking. They're also more likely to live in underserved neighborhoods with high speed arterials cutting through them or along the edge uh, and very poor conditions. Um, oh, that, uh, that graphic, oh, there we go. Uh, it also uh, affects uh, Hispanics, Blacks and African-Americans and Native Americans disproportionately more than uh, uh, Asians and whites. And again, there's kind of an economic uh, correlation there. And it affects older adults more so than, than younger adults. 
And the reason is that there are so many roads near where people live, especially low-income people, that look like this and like this. So um, what I believe is the best strategy for uh, addressing the uh, epidemic of pedestrian deaths is called Vision Zero. And you should be proud to know that Chicago is a Vision Zero city, one of about uh, 50 or 60 now. Uh, that have made a commitment to zero traffic deaths and serious injuries. Uh, another one is Columbia, Missouri, where I live. And um, uh, I'm gonna tell the story of Columbia becoming a Vision Zero city uh, in uh, 2016. Uh, so here we go, here's the map of Missouri. There's Columbia right in the middle. It is the college town about halfway between St. Louis and Kansas City. And I got just a few pictures of the of the city here. We have some very nice bike trails, and walking trails, but we also have these kind of horrendous um, arterial highways that are very unsafe and very unappealing for walking. And then in uh, late 2014, early 2015, uh, we had a spate of pedestrian injuries and deaths over a period of about less than six months, I think, uh, five pedestrians were killed and six or seven were seriously injured. There were three pedestrian uh, crashes on one day in January 2015. So um, we set up a task force council in Columbia, Missouri, and I bugged the mayor to do something about this. He said, OK, let's have a task force. I was one of the co-chairs. And we met for about a year and put together a plan which focused on this idea of Vision Zero. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of different strategies in the plan, but Vision Zero and adopting a Vision Zero policy was, was the main one. And this is the language that we used. And I'm gonna just highlight a few things here. Um, we have set a goal of eliminating traffic deaths and serious injuries in Colombia by 2030. Um, and these uh, 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 clauses are, they, they appear in a lot of other cities vision zero policies as well. And we did ours, you know, uh, uniquely for Colombia in certain ways, but these are typical for vision zero policies. I haven't looked at Chicago's recently, but it's probably similar. So the city council declared that safety is the most important factor in transportation decision-making, that traffic deaths and serious injuries are preventable and therefore they're ethically unacceptable and that transportation systems should be designed and operated so that if somebody makes a mistake, they don't die because of it or kill somebody else because of it, which is what is happening at the moment. And following the, the um, policy, a, um, an action plan was designed by the city manager and the city um, transportation uh, department and police department to reduce the speeds on the streets was the goal. This is um, a map showing where the fatal and serious injury crashes have happened in Colombia. And if you just kind of squint your eyes a little bit and look at that, you can see all of these kind of lines. Well, those are the main arterials which are owned by the state department of transportation and those are the places where people are killed and seriously injured and those are the highways the arterials that we need to change the design of so people stop driving so fast we also need people to uh, pay attention when they're driving so one of the things we did that was part of the vision zero plan was to pass a uh, an ordinance that uh, made distracted driving an offense, it's a primary offense that uh, the police could stop a driver for. And we're also doing road safety audits of these specific um, areas that are killing people to redesign them to slow the traffic down. Now, I will say that passing a Vision Zero policy is not a panacea. There's a lot of resistance in the uh, transportation engineering department here in Colombia to making the changes that need to be done. So it's an ongoing uh, battle to actually uh, achieve it.
But just to finish up now, finish up my uh, presentation, I'm just going to show you some illustrations. As you look at a street and you think, my gosh, somebody's going to drive really fast down there. How do we make it um, make people go slower? I'm just going to do some more of the graphic um, uh, kind of uh, visualizations like the one we had in Batesville to show you what can be done. So again, that's the same location. Landscaping is critical. Narrowing driving lanes is critical. Paint and uh, pavement texturing uh, and creating places for pedestrians. So here's another example. This is a sort of a commercial corridor and you can see how fast drivers are going to go there. But what about if we just invested a little bit of money to do that? You notice there's now a pedestrian bulb out uh, on both sides of the road, which greatly narrows down the gap that the cars have to drive through. And it shortens the crossing distance that the best pedestrians have to cross. And that textured pavement there, the red uh, crosswalk, is very visible to the drivers. And drivers don't mind yielding to pedestrians if it's designed like this and, and if there are pedestrians there. And the final one here, again, another kind of downtown area. Lots of landscaping, lots of complexity. Parking on the street is a good thing. It creates visual friction, slows down vehicles. So my final section then is just, um, and I will uh, send this, um, uh, this presentation to Charles, uh, but here are just some uh, resources that you can look up that speak to what I've been you know, describing today. Smart Growth America produces this uh, analysis every year called Dangerous by Design. Uh, NACTO is um, a, a professional organization of enlightened traffic uh, planners and engineers who understand how we need to redesign our cities to slow down traffic and to, to um, you know, make, make them more walkable and bikeable and increase transit service. The project for public spaces focuses on the micro scale design of public spaces that make them into places that people want to be. Um, this is a great example of a, of a statewide initiative, the Colorado Department of Transportation, after one of those collaborative workshops that I mentioned involving the Department of Health as well and the Department of Economic Development, realized that um, a lot of the communities all over the state of Colorado uh, were um, their, their main streets, their business streets, a little bit like Batesville, Arkansas, was also a state highway and the traffic was going through it so fast that that it was bad for business and so they created this guidebook which gave permission to those local towns uh, as well as some specific design guidance as to how to slow down the traffic in the street a lot of state dot's they won't allow the town mayor the town planning department to make any changes to the state highway that goes through the town and and Colorado is one of the most enlightened um, state DOTs. AARP is a wonderful partner. They support quality of life for older adults in America, and they see walkable, livable communities as part of that. This is a, a toolkit of how to do those kind of pop-up projects. Um, so I think maybe this is my, I mean, we've got a couple more slides. These are just about some of the uh, services that America Walks offers. We can be hired to come in and organize workshops and help a community develop a new vision uh, uh, for their community, uh, learn how to do these walk audits, which I talked about, develop a vision zero policy and put in pop-up projects. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Start our, uh, I'm sorry, let me get question. this. I have a question. Go ahead, uh, Dan. Go ahead, Lana. We'll start okay. our question period. Thank you. Let's, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's for first you. thank our speaker again tonight for. Okay, good, can you uh, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, hold on. I will make a little bit louder. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Zoma, thank you so much for your speech. Very educational, and I learned so much. 
because like I said, I come from different parts of the earth. Uh, so from Europe, and it's absolutely different. Some rules we at least used to. <laughs> so anyway, so are you teacher? What, where are you working for like full-time, part-time? What's your credential? What do you yeah, do? I work full-time for America Walks. As I say, we're a national organization. We're a small organization. Really? Um, Okay, in Illinois, they have this organization? In Illinois, in Chicago? Um, well, America Walks is national, um, and we convene uh, local groups. And in Chicago, uh -huh. there's a group called Active Transportation Alliance. Is anybody familiar with that? Ray, no, Ray, Ray? I don't know. No, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar uh, with it. The American the Bicycle yes. Federation. Yeah, bicycle, yes, it used to be called, exactly. It used to be called the Chicagoland Bicycle Federation. A lot of organizations back in the 90s and the 2000s were bike organizations. And a lot of them kind of expanded their mission about 10 years ago to <laughs> walking and transit and uh -huh. that's what active trans is i uh, what what what, uh, what they do in illinois can you be a bit more specific or you have uh some reachable cell phone number or for, you know like maybe email or website as well and what yeah i'll tell you what illinois? i will i will share my screen again um and show you america walks website which america uh, walks what america walk what my, my uh, our organization's website okay um and i'll show you the page where all of our partner local organizations are in uh, illinois and, and i mean i want to illinois in chicago yep it's organized by state so okay. let's see here we go uh so there it is and local walking organizations and as i scroll up here you see it's just by state um and uh all of these organizations are uh, active creating walkable communities in in the state so there's illinois uh -huh. and you see we Chicago. have the Active Transportation Alliance. Yep. And then there's the uh, Champaign Urbana Safe Routes to School Project and Champaign County Bikes but in, where, um, where, in Urbana, where, Illinois. And in but where in Chicago? Where? Well, um, Let's move on. If, Come you, on. If, Come if, on. if you Google if you Google Active Transportation Alliance, you'll find their website. They work, I think they actually work statewide not just the city of Chicago, but they're based in Chicago. And what the name again? I'm sorry, just give me a second. What, uh, again, what the name of the organization? Active Walking America? Walking, America Walking? Uh, well, my, my, organization is, my organization is America Walks, and the one in Chicago is Active Transportation Alliance. Active Transportation Alliance, okay. Mm -hmm. Tim, all right, I got a question. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Shirley. Uh, uh, just a technical question. I thought any car over five miles per hour was, I didn't get a chance to look at your chart, but I, the figure I always use was in any vehicle over five miles per hour was potentially hazardous. I think that's true. I mean, if, if you think about a very fragile individual like a like a very small child or a very, you know, old frail person, um, I think being hit at five miles an hour can be fatal. The um, the data I showed is the percentage likelihood, you know, averaged over a, a, a lot of um, you know uh, studies. Uh, where people are hit and they can, you know, through forensic yeah. science, determine how fast the car was going and whether obviously the person died or not. And when you do that analysis, then it's typically only about, you know, less than 10%, maybe as little as 5% chance. If you're hit at 20 or 25 miles an hour, 90 to 95% likelihood you'll survive. Once it gets up to 30, that likelihood goes down to about 70%. And once at 40 miles an hour, it's like 50-50. If you're hit at 40 miles an hour, then there's uh, about a 50% chance you'll be killed. Follow-up question. A lot more people are distracted drivers, especially I've been at Zoom <laughs> meetings where the people are driving. Oh, 
crazy. This is ridiculous. I agree. Are you, any figures on that, or are you doing working on? Well, any? I, I I do know that there have been a wave of distracted driving uh, uh, legislation across the country. I mentioned we did one here in Colombia um, for a while. Um, for some reason, police were not allowed to stop a vehicle if they could see if they were driving along you know in the next lane or behind and they could see the person was was, was on their phone they were not allowed to stop them for that but if they did something else like they took a turn without signaling and they stopped them for that they could then ticket them for being on their phone and they changed um, the, the, a lot of places have changed the law now to make distracted driving a primary offense. And if yeah. a police officer sees someone driving distracted, they can just stop them right there and charge them with that. Put them in jail. Jail. Thank All you. right, our caller, uh, I am not sure who you are at 847-442-2935. You got your hand up for, is that Jake? Yeah, hi, how you doing? Uh, yeah, Michael, could you repeat again, um, what do you, what, what do you propose to slow down, uh, slow down, uh, slow down speeding traffic on state highways? The, um, the only, uh, technique that really works, uh, yeah. is to change the design of the highway. The reason yeah. people speed is because the highways are built with very wide lanes they're usually dead straight. There are great setbacks. They don't, state DOTs often won't allow you to plant trees next to the highway uh, because they're worried that a high speed car will go out of control and crash into it and the occupants of the car will be injured. They have a thing called a, um, a clear zone, which says that no permanent structures can be placed within like 30 feet of the edge of the highway to give out of control those kind of things have to be changed if we put landscaping uh, close to the edge if there's a centralized median which has landscaping in it if the lanes are narrowed if curvature is built into the highway instead of um into of signals traffic signals we should have roundabouts with, with large landscaping or public art uh, elements so that as you're driving up towards that intersection, you can see there's something there and you slow down instead of speeding up because you can see the light just went to yellow and you're trying to zoom through at 60 miles an hour just before it turns red and you don't realize that there's a pedestrian who actually has been given a walk signal stepping out in front of you. The, those are the kind of changes. It's design changes. Just changing the speed limit on its own is not effective for the most part. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, anything I've ever Aren't heard. Are speed about. cameras uh, effective? Yes, I, I, I do support speed cameras. People get that um, uh, ticket in the mail because uh, they were caught speeding. And um, I think that can have an effect. Uh, I particularly like speed cameras that actually tell you that they're a speed camera rather than being a sort of a surreptitious speed camera. Um, you, some police departments have a kind of a trailer that they can move to different places where there's a speeding problem and it measures the speed of the vehicle and displays it back to the driver and tells the driver what the speed limit is and warns them that they could be ticketed for that um and it, very often there's no actual camera with that it's a lot of um work to analyze the the uh the, the photographs and work out and, and get you know actually um get a prosecution it's much better if you can deter people without having to go through the process of prosecution and those things that tell people that they're speeding and they need to slow down and they might get a ticket, I think are actually quite effective. But we need design as well. And that improves the, the uh, ambience of the street as well. All right, next questioner, please. We're out of questions. 
<laughs> no, I, I got a question though, Tim. Go ahead, Bob. Um, yeah, Ian, uh, I was I was kind of surprised to see in one of your earlier slides that you mentioned uh, uh, an improvement in walking was, uh, I think you said something about uh, uh, people were afraid of, of the police. Well, that, that's true, yes. Uh, people of color, African-Americans in particular, uh, are very unfairly targeted by um, police in most American cities. There is a culture of racism, white supremacy uh, that permeates through the law enforcement profession. And that's another reason that uh, in our movement, we like to focus on um, engineering changes to improve, uh, you know, to reduce speeding rather than police enforcement. Um, we've seen, you know, so many incidents of uh, black and brown people being stopped by police and the uh, incident ending up in the death of that uh, of that motorist. Um, well, so isn't, isn't, that, isn't that because that motorist has an outstanding warrant and uh, is maybe carrying a gun? Well, uh, it can be. Uh, but when you dig into it, as I have. The entire criminal justice system is very biased against poor people, and many more black and brown people are poor people uh, than, than the general population. Uh, people have an outstanding warrant because uh, they, they couldn't afford to pay the fine that they got the last time because they hadn't renewed their car license because they couldn't afford to do that either. Um, Poor people absolutely struggle day to day. And what a lot of traffic enforcement turns into is extreme punishment for being poor. Yes. Well, don't, you know, perhaps uh, they shouldn't be driving. I mean, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, Illinois, 11.8% of the uh, drivers were uninsured in uh, 20. 19. Now that's that's an average of Illinois. I happen to I happen to have worked at a law I work at a law firm in Chicago, uh, Freeman Kevinites, and uh, we uh, pretty much uh, uh, concentrate in bicycle and pedestrian and vul vulnerable road users as our client base, and uh, we see a lot of un uninsured drivers uh, hitting bicyclists and pedestrians. Uh, we would probably guess more like 20% in, in Chicago. Mm, yeah. Um, well, so, um, I mean, if people, if people paid, if, you know, if people can't afford to pay for insurance, uh, you know, I mean, maybe that's why there's so many cars on the road. Driving is too cheap. The other thing is that uh, uh, the insurance <laughs> minimums, insurance minimums are, are way too low. The, the minimum in most states like Illinois is 25,000. And uh, again, it, it keeps insurance premiums low to keep people on the road. But uh, I don't know if, you, if you've been in the hospital lately. 25,000 25, doesn't go very far in, no. uh, in, in, in uh, you know. So, yeah. so don't, you think well, that, uh, we, don't you think we should have market forces at work here and uh, keep well, people off the road? Um, I, I agree with, I think market forces are helpful in a general sense in many situations where there isn't already systematic injustices in the system. And I, I, I don't understand what you mean by systematic. Uh, uh, you know, I see a speed limit sign that applies to everybody. If uh, there's a, uh, you know, there's a requirement that you have insurance to get your registration. That requires everybody's required. It doesn't say only doesn't say white people are exempt from get, having insurance. Everybody. Well, but what it what it does say is that poor people cannot afford to get insurance, and um, poor people are poor, uh, in my view, because of systematic injustice, not because they are somehow deficient in some way. They are they are bad, and therefore they should be punished by being poor. I believe poverty is a is a direct example of systematic injustice. Um, you may disagree with me on that, and that's that's perfectly fine. 
What I think you would agree with me on is that the way that America's cities and towns have developed in the last uh, 80, 80 to 100 years has made driving almost essential, especially if you are, you know, relatively uneducated, if you're working a low income job, um, you, you, you um, have to have a car to get to work because public transport has been greatly uh, reduced in service and quality in all American cities. We had the spectacle, you know, back in the middle of the last century of all the streetcar lines being ripped up and it was a big campaign by the car companies. So, so the automobile industry uh, uh, forced people to have to get cars and I agree with you that people who can't afford to drive, who can't afford to get insured properly shouldn't be driving. But we have to provide a way for them to get to work and get to services and get to things they need to do. All right. Just uh, can I have a follow up question to Bob here? Yeah, go ahead. My 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 question is if if insurance if 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 auto insurance rates are too low, what does that translate into when somebody has an accident? I'm not sure. I'm not certain if I follow your question, Jay. Well, in other words, why 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 is it a negative to have auto insurance rates low? Okay. Well, auto insurance rates are low because the the coverage is not great enough. They're drive, people are driving around with $25,000 minimum policies. And when you, when you yeah. hit somebody, you know, you hit somebody, you, know, you hit a pedestrian or a bicyclist, it's not so bad if you hit another car. But when you hit a pedestrian or a bicyclist, 25000 doesn't go very far. For instance, a client who was an 80 year old man riding his bicycle and got doored. You know, he just, you know, a lady opened, it was parked and a car flipped open in front of it. He hit, hit the door and fell down and broke his hip. Well, a broken hip surgery when you're 80 years old with all the physical therapy, the home nursing you have to have when you come back, you know, all right. that, that's $80,000. That's $80, and the lady had a $25,000 yeah. policy. So you see, the, you know, tw so $25,000 does not go very far. Fortunately, this guy was a, a retired uh, University of Chicago professor. And he had a, uh, you know, gilded, uh, ins you know, health insurance policy. So he was able to get all his expenses covered. But, uh, but there's a lot of people that aren't in that situation. So you're and saying, you're saying you're, right. So you're saying, you're saying auto insurance rates need, need to go up in order, in order to reflect the, the true cost of covering the cost of an accident. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the coverage needs to be, you know, the minimum coverage needs to be drastically increase from 25,000 go up that will raise premiums uh and again the you know uh people if people can't afford it then they shouldn't be driving there needs to be some more um safeguards to keep people from driving without insurance what we see this is what we see in chicago all the time at the law firm somebody buys a car yeah. they go they go right. get some cheap insurance uh like American Alliance or, you know, or uh, unique insurance or something yeah. like that. They pay for yeah. one, one or three months of insurance to get their registration. And then they quit paying and they're canceled. And then they have an accident. And then, you know, we get like a law firm like us gets dragged into it to represent the plaintiff and we call for insurance and they go, Oh, that, that was, that was canceled in March. So he's, this happens all the time. People just, they get their, they, right. they only buy insurance get to get the uh, so they can get their registration and then they quit making payments so and there's no teeth in the law there's the uh the uh the uh you know it's just i mean the sun times did a series about 10 years ago on people in yeah. traffic court the people that have had yeah. their license suspended and all that stuff they drive to their court date park in the garage at daily center and go in there and you know get their you know, go in front of the judge and then they then they get suspended for the DUI or whatever it was, then they get back in their car and they drive home. And there's still people are still driving. They just there's no right. teeth in the law. If there's no yeah, there's no sentencing. People should do some jail time. 
some community service or something like that when they get caught driving without insurance, but 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 they don't. Well, particularly the particular the DUI, yeah, right. Okay, right. let's move on to our next question. And Margaret's got her hand up. Yeah, I've got my hand up. When are you coming to Dallas, Ian? I agree with you about poor people, systemic injustice. And uh, here in Texas, of course, somebody who does not have papers cannot get a driver's license. I mean, this is just, it just reverberates. So they don't get a driver's license. Uh, they probably, <clears throat> they probably don't, they might not carry insurance. Who knows? But it's complex. But my question is, when are you coming here? I live on Turtle Creek Boulevard in Dallas. It's uh, uh, loaded with high rises. I'm in the least expensive. We have, just for an example, we have had a woman mowed down. She was walking at 10 o'clock in the morning. Somebody lost control. We have asked for speed bumps. We're across from a beautiful creek with, mm -hmm. uh, with beautiful ducks. Some of those ducks have been slaughtered by these drivers. My understanding here is that they cannot put speed bumps in because this is a street that the first responders have to use. And it's a 30 mile zone and it, it loops around a little bit. And in the middle of the night, some drunk went over the railing and killed himself because he was, you know, a speeding, no doubt. Didn't, wasn't even awake. So when are you coming to Dallas, Ian, to talk to our city council? <laughs> We're needed everywhere. That's all I have to say. And the presentation is fabulous. Thank you, Margaret. I, I'd be happy to come and, and do what I can. I just quickly went on the American Walks website to, to uh, see what organizations are in Dallas. I'll share my screen. Um, so there is one organization that's part of America Walks. Um, uh, kind of national network in Dallas called A New Dallas, and I'm just looking at this for the first time, says Highway 345 is falling apart. We think it should be torn down. Here's why. And this is an example of quite a movement across the country, which I think is very positive. A lot of highways were built. Sometimes they were elevated highways. Sometimes they were in trenches. Sometimes they were on the surface. They very often went right through poor neighborhoods and black neighborhoods. And sometimes it was intentional uh, and, and created divisions in the town. Uh, and Highway 345 is, is undoubtedly an example of that. The um, Biden administration uh, in the in the um, uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill that was just passed a couple of months ago has a new program specifically to fund the dismantling of, of highways that have destroyed neighborhoods and destroyed uh, cultures. Uh, and invest in public transportation instead uh, to replace the need for that highway. So I think that's a very positive opportunity. And, and I would suggest you look up this uh, a New Dallas organization and get connected with them and see how you can be part of what they're trying to do. I'm not aware of it. I'm going to pass this along to Lee Bass, who's been working on it. I'm also going to send her Charlie's cloud connection. This is just very, very helpful. All right, who's okay, Charlie? Uh, Charlie, go ahead and ask another question. Anybody else? Uh, not that I'm seeing right now. Um, and, right, and I'm gonna uh, have to probably jump off after this one, Charlie. So go ahead. Okay, uh, oh, wait, wait a minute. Bob's got, I'll, 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 I'll take Bob's one last. Go, right, ahead, go ahead, Bob. All right, Bob, go ahead. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, Ian, I was also uh, speaking about crime and everything. Uh, I've noticed, uh, in the, you know, in my own uh, experience as well, I'm, a, I'm an avid walker. Um, and one thing I love doing is going on photo walks. I'm also uh -huh. a hobbyist photographer and very relaxing and everything. But you know what? It's in Chicago, uh, because we have one of the George Soros attor uh, attorneys, uh, Kim Fox, who's not no longer prosecuting criminals, uh, Chicago has been <laughs> overrun with crime, and it's no longer safe to walk. The, I don't, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but there's like an epidemic in Chicago now. If you're just walking down the street, even in what good neighborhoods like the Magnificent Mile, uh, people just pull over in a car, hop out, put a pistol on you, take your backpack and your keys and your wallet and your watch, and then maybe shoot you. 
and then get back in the car and take off. So it's it's no longer safe to walk, and it's also no longer safe to uh, to take public transit. Uh, almost almost is getting attacked on CTA and lost from from train or something like that. So hello, you're you're breaking up. You're oh. you're breaking up. So anyway, uh, it's, it's it's not safe. Yeah, I, I think Bob. I think I think I I got your I got your drift, and um, I do want to say I uh, very much appreciate the fact that in your law for, law firm you uh, defend the victims of traffic violence, um, and I think that you and I probably have a similar long range vision for how communities ought to be, and they ought to be safe from violent crime. Um, and people ought to be able to go out for a walk without uh, fearing somebody, you know, j jumping them with a pistol and so on. And, and it is a, a terrible problem in Chicago and many other big cities. It's even a problem where I live in a small town. Um, we, we have multiple shootings every year. They're mostly confined to certain neighborhoods, but you can kind of get caught in the crossfire uh, uh, if if you're if you're out, you know, uh, in the wrong you know wrong place at the wrong time. Um, but I think you and I might differ on the strategies or maybe the underlying causes. And I would say, you know, most violent crime is the result of economic inequality, which is the result of um, injustices within the system that have existed for generations, even for centuries. Um, and that that is where we should uh, address our efforts to change things and create true opportunities for people so that they do not end up seeing violent crime as as a um, as as a pathway, um, I'm not convinced that um, trying to you know apprehend and punish people uh, um, is taking us in the right direction. Okay, I have a question, Mr. Thomas. Kindly, if you can give me uh, kindly your reachable website, I would like to read some more, yeah. perhaps, and your email, please. He's yep, my, my email is in the um, is in the chat. Ian is I don't know. I don't. I don't know how to. I, I don't know how okay. to. Okay. Uh, well, can, uh, can you put again kindly? If uh, you can. So so uh, it's Ian. That's I A N. I A N. At, okay. Yep. At America so, Walks, just the way it sounds. Just uh, run the two like, words together. America Walks. You mean like, o -R -G. Uh, you know, I don't know. Can you put, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, can you kindly put to the screen so I can take a look okay. and write it? It's eon at americawalks.com or dot net or what? It's dot, it's dot org. Okay, here. Yeah, it, it, it's yeah, on, but it's I, on. I have a little problem. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Jan, like uh, uh, J, first letter J, Jan. Here we go. Can you see that? There we go. There's my phone number and my email address oh hold on, hold on. let me write it in. oh okay thank you i'll just leave time. that out there for you uh okay. now wait, charlie wait, wait, did, did you have one more question before i jump off oh, no uh, no i just want to yes, yes, yes. covered it i was yeah. talking about safety Ed in the america street. all right eliana please hold on america please be quiet uh, no. i just Walk want to thank eight. our speaker that order uh, okay thank Eliana. you Please okay, okay, all right, okay. I'm be listening. quiet. I'm listening. All right, I want to thank our speaker. My question concerns street safety thank you. and uh, things like gun control and stuff like that, but you kind of covered it. Anyhow, thank you very much for a very excellent presentation, and thank you for your work. I've been on your email group, I think, since the onset. And the oh, great. Of the great. Good to see you, Charlie. Yeah. Great. Well, it's been a great Thank pleasure you. to meet you all, and um, uh, enjoy the rest of your of your too bad, session. Too bad Thank you won't so stick much. around for the rebuttals. It gets really Thank interesting so after a while. All right, if you gotta go, you gotta go. Well, Charlie, you did it again. Another speaker who wouldn't stay the entire time. Jeez. It what was did I do? Good, uh, Tim and Charlie. It was wonderful because we've all got. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if you walk at all, you've got yeah. concerns. <laughs> Personally, I think the motor car was one of the best things that ever happened to America. <laughs> And I mean, you know, if you get helps movements of goods and it gets people out and about, I mean, even the oh, sure, oh, sure, and it made it made it sure and made it possible for Eisenhower to to establish the uh, uh, federal highway program, right? And the other the other thing too is that it helped knit <laughs> America together. I mean, goods and services and businesses can transfer goods a lot faster, and they can move commerce a lot easier, and it's a lot easier to get around these days. I mean, they live 35 miles from work, and I can get to Franklin Park in less than 45 minutes, usually. And see, that's what our poor, our middle class, working class people have to have in Dallas. Housing is so expensive in the inner city. They have to be in yeah. the and then drive. Well, you know, the only, um, <laughs> well, I know that, but, uh, you know, finally, it's uh, getting things done in. You know, the funny thing is, is I'm looking at America Walk's website. And, uh, you know, I just want to, if you guys don't, oh, anyway, we'll get into the rebuttals in a little bit. Is there any more questions before we get into them real quick? Because I think we'll just go in straight into rebuttals now. And I'll, I'll allow everybody about four or five minutes, depending on what they want to say. And uh, who would like to do rebuttals tonight? Yeah, Margaret, I'll say something. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Margaret. Then Margaret. Margaret Aguilar, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that that what you say about public transportation is in fact that's true. You you, you know, it's it's certainly made our lives kind of easier in many ways, but it hasn't it hasn't really it it's sort of delusionary and or illusionary in some sense. We still spend the same amount of time, uh, whether because we do 50 miles an hour or whatever going to work, or in some cases, 10 miles an hour going to work. Uh, so we spend the same amount of time than before when we worked in our neighborhoods and we walked to work. We, so we spend a fair, almost the same amount of time with, um, I'm going to list all the negative stuff. We spend the same amount of time in transportation. We think it makes it easier and shorter and, and, and more timely, but it does not for the most part. Um, second, of course, the pollution from in the atmosphere. And, um, oh boy, no, I can't remember this. Oh, and the other thing is, is because this is so prevalent and so it seems like it's so necessary for modern life, we're willing to sacrifice 50,000 people a year, plus or minus, in traffic accident fatalities. And so, um, you know, so every year that many people die and it, people don't even think of it as a price that we pay for having private transportation like this. So, um, I really think that what he's saying is very interesting. And I think we've also done it in Chicago. I th I'm thinking of Wilson Avenue and, um, uh, and I can't remember, but there's a couple of streets on the, on the north side that um, have done, look very similar to the things that he showed uh, there and people really appreciate it. And so I'm, um, grateful that, uh, but, but I think that must have been the, the inspiration for it, what he's done. So we've implemented some of this in, in some places. And so I'm hoping that maybe it, it'll be implemented more widely in Chicago so we, we can bike safely and not that I'll get on a bicycle in, at any time in the near future, but, or, or even for the rest of my life. But um, but I do walk, and to have something like that that's pedestrian friendly is uh, really a good thing because people really take their lives in their hands when they go walking these days, and not just from crazy drive-by shootings, but from cars that are normally on the street. So that's my comment. Okay, Brian. Mar Margaret, I just tried to say hello. Uh, she's on okay. Ileana, this is not the appropriate time, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank right. you. I mean, I just say season greetings, you know. Okay, so, Brian, you're ready okay. to go wait, with wait, your wait, next wait. I want to say. Uh, 
Lana, let's let let's go in. Okay, Brian, you got your next set of comments, so go ahead and uh, take your time and uh, let us know what you think. You got about five minutes to give, say your piece or whatever, and go ahead. Thank you. So, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. So I was going to remark about you know being a libertarian and the uh, the roads. Libertarians are always starting to talking about the roads, right? Because the roads require maintenance. They require, it's a huge infrastructure project. You have to dig up a lot of land. There's a lot of concrete that's used, tar, um, labor, the heat, the way that it kind of shapes the environment, shapes the lifestyle of, in one of these kind of traditional, um, traditionally set up American towns, you'd have like business commercialist districts on the busy streets and then within the neighborhood you'd have the residential so it's all built to you know require you to use cars and, and transportation and transportation to the store um it's in everything we do it's town by town by town they're all built relatively the same so how you know do we get away from the roads right to stop building the roads and maintaining the roads that you know, kind of bind us or, or you know, guide us to <clears throat> living certain lifestyles. Um, so I'm happy to hear about the Walk America movement that uh, to start digging up some of these roads, getting rid of them. Um, so we don't have to, you know, keep paying government to come out and send our guys and, you know, um, to maintain the roads, um, <clears throat> you know, that people can walk, right? So the question then becomes, how do we maintain whatever paths that people are now walking on? You know, gravel, sand, salt, um, <clears throat> all of those, you know, they have maintenance costs as well, you know, because if people want concrete sidewalks, well, you know, you kind of just, you're just replacing the concrete of the roads with the concrete of the sidewalk, although the sidewalk will have a significantly longer life uh, than a road would. So I'm happy to hear it. it uh, you know, I'll start talking about walking and let's uh, dig up some of these roads uh, so that we don't have to keep spending our money to maintain them. And we don't have to keep being guided towards this lifestyle. Of everybody must have a car in order to get to the store. And so that's it. That's my comment. I just would like very quickly to add it. You know, it's very nice to take walk uh, for people who are capable to walk. All right, Lana, I'm going to give you five minutes to go ahead no, and do your rebuttal. I just need, I just need to uh, give me just a couple of seconds. So, but my point is, you know, roads, sidewalks, like maybe uh, eldermen or congressmen, they need to, you know, in our state, they need to pay more attention to roads to with people walking because some of them cracked and some of, some of them uh, have not, uh, you know, comfortable way to walk. So they need to fix roads for walkable roads. <laughs> How to say English? I hope I say right. Uh, for the sidewalks, right? When people walking, it's called sidewalks, right? So uh, that's what's my comment. I mean, like if people can maybe pay more attention to talk to older men or or to congressman or to senator, whoever uh, responsible to fix and the uh, walk when people walk can walk comfortable. Like I would like to walk comfortable, <laughs> not to have crack roads or or not close to the roads when car, you know, when car running, we had on mine. But uh, you know, but this was my point. Roads supposed to be fixed for people to be able to walk, like myself. Thank you. Okay, who's next on the rebuttals? All right. Um, um, go I'll ahead. Go. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, you told me you're sorry about your commute, Tim. Uh, mine is just the opposite. When I relocated to Chicago, I made a concerted effort uh to secure an occupation position within the loop which enabled me to commute every day then i had a, three different routes to choose from and actually more depending on the closer i got to commuting to work and each day i could read the new york times it was timed perfectly i get a hard copy 
the nationwide edition and I could read the New York Times while you were driving your car. Of course, you can listen to tapes, but I don't think that is any way comparison to reading a nationwide edition of the New York Times. Now, as a result of that, over 40 year period, I think I'm significantly uh, more informed than people who were driving their cars. Uh, also, uh, an ancillary to that, I discovered much of my leisure time activities took place downtown as well. And I still remember one period where I went to all sorts of events and I had never left the, the downtown area, given the multitude of cultural institutions that were there, the culture center and uh, the museums and so forth. So I never had to leave. So both my work and leisure time activities were based on a very easy commute. Uh, to say that you had a preference, Tim, is, is not, is, I'm sorry, I, and then you had the expense of uh, uh, maintaining a vehicle as well, which a gentleman indicated could be somewhere between up towards of $18,000. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I win this issue here. Um, the uh, issue of yeah, walkability is, I've been around with this organization for many, many years, actually almost since its inception, I believe. Um, at least keeping up with it. Um, there is a thing, a concept of, of the eco village or sustainable communities in which you make an assessment overall, if you wish, of the carbon footprint of your community. Um, certainly, the reduction in uh, the uh, need to use fossil fuels overall by all the residents of the community is certainly necessary at this point in time. And really think of what that can, community could benefit as well, instead of contributing to the CEOs of uh, ExxonMobil, having a, a, a very plush lifestyle. <laughs> I, I keep it like he said, you know, you retain the, uh, the economics within your community. I think Bob Matter, you would appreciate that. Um, the localized businesses and so forth also enable, I think also the young people are employed within those businesses as well. Uh, certainly appreciate having uh, uh, them in their location. That's just basically some random thoughts. I hope everyone enjoyed, I thought it was a pretty good talk and I learned a lot. Actually, I have a new fond appreciation of that organization. I, I must submit a subsequent to this presentation. Thank you. You know, I've often wondered, uh, you guys are so dead set against cars, but it was one of the biggest reasons why we were able to industrialize. I think it's been, um, Personally, I think it's been one of the greatest things around. I remember when I got my driver's license, the first thing I remember was, my God, am I free? I can go anywhere I want and do anything I want and associate with my own friends and uh, go places. That means I can get up to the state line and uh, go see uh, a band play against a lake up in Twin Lakes, Wisconsin. It could mean I could go to the, uh, it could mean I could then go to like at Kenosha, Wisconsin, out to the harbor and go take a look out there it could mean I could go downtown and with another friend and we could take tours of the city. It also meant that we could run to Rockford and see a film festival at some point. Or go you to couldn't get into the city before that? We've been into the city before that. Well, um, I drove how did into, it change? I, dro I drove into the city many a times when I was 18, 19 years old. That's and where I got car, my architecture. It like $50 to park a car, doesn't it? Well, not really. You go to the right type of lot, you can go anywhere. Go to the one right by the county jail and uh, $10 lets you park your car almost all night long and you might have to walk. County jail, what are you talking great. about? It's great. Downtown? 
downtown, you can do that. Go right near the Sears Tower. There's a parking lot there for under 10 bucks. And you just have okay. to walk. Okay. Okay. Well, many a time. I, I, okay. I just, That's the best I just part about it is, is when you when you right. leave uh, right. when you leave the city, you're home in 45 minutes instead of an hour and a half, two hours. It's going to take you by taking public right. right. transit. Right. 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 Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, I I just want to say in response to that, I'm not. I'm not at all opposed to driving. I just think we need better, better uh, public transit. And I don't think it's just a matter of. of I, I don't think it's just a matter of giving giving more money to the CTA and the other transit agents agencies. It's 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 a, it's a it's a question of getting the right people in there to control the thing because right now most of the, most of the people who get appointed, uh, they're all appointed. They're all appointed by. Uh, like CTA mayor of Chicago and, and governor of Illinois, and I don't know about Pace. It's a combination of and Pace and, and Metro's combination of things. But the point is, most of the people who are appointed to those positions are appointed for political reasons that have nothing at all to do with knowledge about about transportation. I think that needs to change. I think we need to to get some people who have a real understanding of transportation in those positions in order to make it work better. And then more people will use it. And we'll have fewer p- private cars. Look at, out look, at, the look at New York City in the subway. New York would uh, drop dead if it didn't have its subway system. It's like its arterial oh. arteries. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, 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 the New, if, if New York didn't have their subway system, you wouldn't be able to drive anywhere. The roads would be too clogged. With, I mean, there, the, the, there would some, be so much traffic congestion, you wouldn't be able to get anywhere. I still think though Robert Moses was right in building all those roads into New York. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, oh, Margaret, go ahead. Oh. Margaret, uh, Angela, you got your hand up, so go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I do have my hand up. I wanted to ask you, I have been kind of looking for the past uh, videos of the past things and yeah, the latest video I can find. I'm not is posted in, yet. That's why I got to do it. 2020. I know. Okay, so no, they haven't been posted. I'll be getting them taken care of fairly quickly. That's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> that's two years worth. <laughs> I know. Tim, I know. Tim, Tim, you've said about ten times. I've not pressured you multiple but, times that you could. It's going to be next week. How about tomorrow? Let's see what you do. Let's I see by next both. week what you got. All right? Let's hold this conversation next Saturday. Okay. <laughs> All yeah, right, I, you know, I, yeah, I know exactly. I, She's entirely correct. She's from right. March, from March of about 20. I haven't was, posted yeah, March, March 4th. It was the Women's Day program in March. A year, more than a year and a half ago. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no, so when, next when, Saturday, we will discuss, we'll continue this conversation, okay? okay? <laughs> yeah, but it's just a question, I mean, because then, uh, problem is I, I there are some posting. times when I feel like I make a total idiot of myself, and I just want to go back and see how much of an idiot I made of myself, uh, well, and it's not there. <laughs> so well, that's all. I mean, just a matter of, it just, I got lazy, that's all I'm going to say. Just got okay. lazy. And we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Comments are always profound. Mm-hmm. All right. Um good at I want to ask you something if I may. I mean, are you woke lately? I mean, not when right now slippery outside, but did you walk uh, last year pretty much or you kind of I, I actually, were flexible about it, Margaret. Well, no, I, we we walk every day, but we, and we have for the past since we've moved here. For, for and, how long? Um, how long you walk? Uh, well, it's it's restricted by by Frank, but pretty much we just walk a block and uh-huh. and, and we uh-huh. come back, but. We haven't for the past couple of days because of the IC. And yeah, the yeah, yeah, I understand. So, but it's been, the weather's been good, so we've been walking. Yeah. Bob Mann has got too. his hand raised. Me All right, too. Bob, I go like ahead. I like weather, you know. Yeah, I, yeah, I like please. to walk. All right, Bob, go ahead. So, um, I guess uh, uh, it sounds like our speaker 
there's been uh, blue. The whole thing is weird with buzzwords. Oaken is talking about, you know, equity and, you know, worried about, uh, you know, police, uh, over policing black and brown people and all that stuff. So I, I you know, I think you gotta, if you would, you would uh, get rid of all that stuff, uh, the rest of what he's got to say is pretty good. And there's other. What? Bobby, you're, you're fading in and out. You're fading. Can't hear you. Actually, well, we can't hear you. His connection probably can't hear you. Probably, he's going to probably log back in. There he is. Okay. Looks like I got, uh, I lost my connection there briefly. Um, back on now. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, our, our, so our speaker sounded uh, like I said, like he's been blue pilled, um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, he had a lot of good things to say. I wanted to mention uh, that people can go to a website called walkscore.com, and I believe that will tell you. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the exact website or not. I can't really find the one. I was exactly looking for it. There was one a while back ago that I was on that you could type in your address and then it would give you a walk score of your neighborhood. And it's based on how far things were uh, within walking distance. And I know my mine uh, actually here in Indiana was actually pretty good because I live over here by Purdue Calumet. So I've got a supermarket and a, you know, and a school uh, within walking distance dry cleaner i'm not a dry cleaners anymore but a uh a store you know burger king a kentucky fried chicken walgreens a bank um so really all the you know anything you really need is you know you, you can get to uh, unfortunately there was a there was a dry cleaners on, on the corner from me and it, it closed up but uh, uh other than that though there's, there's a lot of you know walkable things now generally um the website's called walkscore.com. Oh. You can find out about any, uh, you know, like where I live, most of my errands, it's a walk score of 35. Most errands require a car. And then there's some bike infrastructure. <laughs> can you hear me again? Yes, we can. Okay, I keep getting logged off. Um, so anyway, yes, the problem is uh, you're breaking the problem up. Was, uh, expensive. You're breaking up. Uh, okay, I see that. I'm uh, getting a warning here that my internet connection is unstable. Um, yeah, I don't have a good internet connection. Um, anyway, so yeah, the problem with walkable neighborhoods is that they're very expensive because, of course, uh, all benefits of society accrue to the landowners. Um, so people will go, they will drive as far as necessary uh, to get, you know, uh, reasonably priced housing. And that, that kind of is the rub here in all this. Uh, we really need probably a Georgia system of, of, of land uh, taxing to, uh, to uh, you know, level that playing field out. I don't know if it'll ever happen in my lifetime. Maybe it'll happen in the in future lifetimes. Uh, right now, though, my uh, my major concern is the is the crime wave, which is undoubtedly spurred by uh, criminals that know that they are will not be held accountable for their actions, and that's why they're robbing it's, and shooting and everything. It's it's not because of you know it, it, you know no opportunities or whatever. They have opportunities just like everybody else does uh, to, to do things. They have chosen uh, the easy way out of, you know, robbing and, and stealing and, uh, and, and murdering yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, in agreement, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement with you. I voted for Kim Fox once, once, was, once was enough, but, but I, I, I think there are probably some worse, worse actors in the system right now. <laughs> 
yeah, and this is a, this is the same thing that's going on in all the all the big blue cities that have these George Soros uh, attorneys. Uh, and, as a matter of fact, it's really going to get a lot worse in New York because there's, they have this new district attorney named Bragg, and he's already come on record saying that he is no longer going to prosecute felonies uh, unless it's you know, it'll have to actually be like a murder. But if uh, somebody just you know puts a gun in your ribs and takes your wallet on the street, uh, that's considered a, a misdemeanor. So what they're doing is you know in the name of uh, justice is they're they are uh, redefining crime. You know the problem is we know that like you know if that uh, that uh, there's a there's a crime problem in the black community, and uh, in the way to solve it. Instead of addressing the real issues, they're just going to redefine crime so that uh, that these, you know, so like uh, armed robbery will no longer be a crime, really. It'll be a misdemeanor, and they'll probably even get bargained down to, to something like that. So uh, uh, that's uh, uh, something. What? So your solution, your, your society has no criminals if you hire a sheriff? No, our study would have a lot less you crime if we actually to prosecute crime. You have to put criminals away. You have to have laws with laws with teeth and There'll accountability. No People commit crime. No, I got a, I've got a, uh, I've got a case book in criminal law sitting right here by my bed, and uh, uh, it says in one of the chapters in there, uh, the author it's now right on the head. He said, uh, you know, crime is a, uh, criminals make a cost benefit analysis before they do a crime. And they, what they do is they weigh the benefit of the crime against the cost of the crime. And the cost is the uh, chance of apprehension and the severity of punishment. And when, you, when we see that, like in, in, in uh, Cook County, for instance, that the, uh, the uh, risk of apprehension is very low and the severity of punishment is practically nil if that goes down then crime is going to be for people they you know they're making their way you're breaking up again you're breaking up higher. again oh. okay sorry about that part's lower <laughs> i don't know if that'll help it's my internet connection is bad here um t-mobile bought sprint and and my internet's just been shit ever since so I think I'm gonna to have to get a new uh, provider. But um, anyway, so that's uh, that's the thing. That's what causes crime. And uh, so if you don't have any teeth in your law, uh, then you're gonna have an increase in, in crime because the criminals make that make those judgments, those cost benefit analyses. And I highly recommend, by the way, if you want to see what's really going on with crime, you're only getting a, a little, you know just a hint of what's going on if you read the tribune or the sun times you really got to go to the web cwb chicago and that stands for originally it came out as it stands for crime wrigleyville boys town chicago now it's just it's cwb chicago.com and those guys really get to you know where they were on all the crime and they report on it in detail uh, and they started this several years ago because of the deficiencies, you know, the mainstream media reporting crime. So I highly recommend going over there to see what's <clears throat> what's really going on. In the so the best community, yeah. that's like a sheriff of Nottingham, right? All right, we got people with their hands raised, Tim. All right, go ahead, Brian. Brian, you got your hand up. And Margaret, you got your hand up, so go ahead. Brian and then Margaret. Okay. Um, so I ran against Kim Fox. I mean, you know, in this last election, I was on the media. I was asked uh, on Univision um, <clears throat> by Alex Hernandez uh, what I thought that Kim Fox was doing right. And, um, <clears throat> and I told him, uh, you know, the under Kim Fox, so the murder rate had until last year, like 2000, the murder rate had steadily gone down. She's, you know, not prosecuting low level drug offenses, which is a positive development. It's using the prosecutorial resources. 
freeing them up from prosecuting nonviolent criminals to prosecuting violent criminals. So, you know, I did not criticize her. Um, and, you know, it's like, I live in Chicago, right? I, you know, I haven't had anybody pull a gun on me. There's no drive-by shootings around here. Yeah, I mean, here, here. I, I, all I can say is, all I can say is, you're lucky. Well, I, I mean, it's, I live in a certain area, right? I live outside of Boys Town in, in Buena Park, so yeah. you know, I know that there are areas of the city where violent crime is occurring on a regular basis, and it is in predominantly black areas of the city. It has been like that since I have been. Yeah like an adult or, or even since a teenager, like I'm from this city. I grew up in the back of the yards. To the okay. black neighborhoods in this city, they, there has been violence in those, those areas, predominantly those areas for a long time. There's yeah. nothing new about uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, all, I can say is, all I can say is, I always once held up at gunpoint, up, not, in, not in the city, but up in, up in Evanston, by Evanston High School. Yeah. Well, it, it happens. I'm not saying it doesn't. So the yeah. thing is, I'm like, well, like, what's the solution to this, this issue, this issue that has been going on for 30, 40 years, right? I mean, this yeah. is, there's nothing extraordinary about this. I mean, I remember when I was a teenager, the city, you know, it's like, you know, there was 900 homicides on a regular basis in the city, and it all happened in certain areas, like, you know, there's nothing new, right? So what are we gonna do to fix this problem, right? It's all this, you know, oh, we're not prosecuting. Here, you're prosecuting the wrong people, right? You're using prosecutorial resources to, to go arrest drug dealers, drug users, right? People, yeah. you know, drug conservatives dealers, complain dealers, about drug, yeah. people in the inner city drug, not having right. jobs. Well, they got jobs, right? It's called drug yeah. salesman, drug distributor, right, drug right, manufacturer, right, right, right. Bag man, those are jobs that bring in money. People come from this from the suburbs, from right, other parts right. of the city, and go in there and buy drugs. This has been happening forever, right? right? Yeah. So, what are you going to do? Right. To, like the violence is associated with that activity because it is illegal, because it is in cash, because the you know, in order to be engaged yeah. in that activity, by definition, you are now a criminal. Right. So, you know, and, and prison hardens people. You have yeah. like the drug war has been so destructive. And yeah, yeah. this, this cry this for we We've need more prosecutions. We need the prosecution. Well, we need, to stick. Well, we need, we need to prosecute well, we need, the right people. Legalize yeah, well, we need, why the violent well, people. We, well, we not need, drug dealers, well, we need, not drug right. users, not sex workers. Drug dealers are violent drug people. Dealers are, and leave the other people are, alone. Drug dealers are extremely violent. The pro part of the problem is because that they go the after business the is violent. If the business was legal, it wouldn't be violent. You don't oh, have where, you know, where, liquor where, store where, salesmen where, where, shooting where. each other because they sell their stuff out of the storefront. No, but they don't but, want but, violence no, but, in their area because it's it's bad for business. There, right? there are liquor, you, there, the, there are liquor, there are liquor stores which get held, which get held up on a regular basis. Okay, and and that's you know that's a different issue. Right. And, and okay. the problem is that prosecutorial resources, police resources are being used to chase drug dealers who are engaged right. in voluntary, peaceful activities. Selling drugs it's not voluntary. Is voluntary. At all. It's it's, not, there's no, nobody it's not being harmed in that except the user. Nobody else is involved in that. I'm not. That involved. isn't so. Not that my issue. So. Most 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 drug dealers carry guns. They okay, because their business them. is illegal. See what you're you're not you know, I'm I'm asking you to, to kind of make legal, that connection. If it were illegal, if the business if drugs, were legal, drugs, they wouldn't drugs, have to do that. If drugs, if drugs were legal, where is the addict to get the where would the addict get his money to pay for the drugs? <laughs> he could work in the drug store. He yeah. could be yeah, he could be the so bad guy most, and we could still collect the, taxes from him, right? I mean, the thing yeah, is, well, are you well, saying well, people well, could well, be well, growing well, and distributing yeah, and manufacturing, well, and we could be collecting taxes instead I, I don't, of I don't and using those taxes to defer the costs I don't buy it. instead I don't of buy using it. cops and prosecutors and jails and all it. the rest of this I don't stuff. Buy it. Jake, the drug dealers. Speak, Jake. 
Can I can I just can I just finish what I was saying? The drug yeah. de- the, the cops should go after the drug dealers because they're the real criminals. There, the drug the low level drug users should put into should be put into some kind of rehab program to and, and tough to get off of it. And that's what Kim Fox is doing. That's exactly what she's doing. So there's all this criticism about Kim Fox, but that is what she's doing. She's yeah. they're still going well, after they're still going after dealers. All right, Margaret right? got her hand up now. So let's probably let have up. a question uh, because you all are in Illinois. I'm in Texas, which has very liberal gun laws. Very easy for pe- to, people to obtain guns. What is the law in Illinois? It is very difficult to own a gun up here. It, like you have to get a card. So, so it's a shell issue state, right? So when you submit to get a FOID card, they do a criminal investigation. You got to certify that you haven't, you know, you, you haven't done certain acts. They run a background check on you and then it's a shell issue. So they, they'll give you a FOID card, but Good. to maintain the FOID card, there's a million ways in which you can lose the FOID card. Right. And they're very eager to take it away from you. They do this a lot. So if you go like in divorce court, right, if you get subject to an emergency order of protection, which happens a lot, then your FOID card is immediately revoked. You got you got 48 hours to turn over your FOID card and all your weapons to the police or to to someone else who owns a FOID card. Well, so, Texas, you know, has a very repressive, basically, you know, very repressive. read about what's going on in Texas. The most egregious thing that just has happened within Oh, the last few days, a father drove a 14 year old to a convenience store. He maintains he didn't know his kid was going to kill people. However, the kid had a gun. Uh, It's very, you know, man is behind, father's behind bars. The kid has escaped. They've even given his name because it's so egregious. So he kills three people in this convenience store. You know, I have no idea whether it was, you know, what the purpose or we will never know. But guns are very readily accessible to people of all kinds. Yeah, they they are. And they are here, too. I mean, despite being illegal, I mean, like when I when I was growing up in Chicago, they had a rule here where it was a you could own a registered firearm, but there was nowhere to register your firearm. Mm -hmm. So it was owning a firearm was effectively a a felony. Right. Mm -hmm. And, And so this was the law for decades. You know, so, you know, that's that's Illinois and that's certainly Chicago, but guns are re- readily available. People can go to Indiana and get them and just drive over the border. I mean, it's not like, yeah. you know. Yeah. I'm told, I'm told that I think it was in the state of Missouri. They just passed this absurd law called the Second Amendment Protection Act, which says that if if you're stopped by by the police and they find they find guns on you, uh, and, and particularly multiple guns. They can conf- if they confiscate the guns, you can turn around and sue the police officer for up to fifty thousand dollars for 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 violating or violating violating your 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 rights under the Second Amendment. And the absurdity of it is there are police officers and other law enforcement types who are opposed to the law because they feel that it because they feel that it, it favors the criminals. Well, doesn't it kind of do so? I mean, if a guy's got multiple guns in his Right, 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 right. They're, 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 apparently there's a drug dealer who's suing, who's suing a cop for, for taking his weapons away. Yeah, well. So I, I, think, I think the Founding Fathers intended the Second Amendment to apply to law and for law, law-abiding citizens, not to convicted <laughs> not to convicted felons. Uh, drug dealers do not have the right to bear arms. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to disagree with you on that. Every single person in this world has the right and it's natural and it's unalienable to defend themselves by any means necessary. And that includes firearms. If they are not in the custody of the state, that they are a free person, their rights should automatically be restored to them any rights that were restricted while they were incarcerated or, or in the custody of the state, including their right to bear arms. So this idea that somehow criminals have become dehumanized, that their rights have been diminished in some way, no. Brian, no right, no right at all has ever been exercised in the absolute. For example, free speech, 
You don't have free speech at work in many other situations. So don't tell me you have an absolute right to weaponry to endanger the community. That does not right, does not equate man. So don't tell me you have an absolute right to firepower. And and not having firepower means that your life is being threatened. No, that's not the case. So you you wait, wait, I'm not I'm not your life wait a sec, please. That means in general your life is threatened. My life is not right. being threatened right now. I'm sorry, right. I don't need a weapon. Okay, I'm gonna right. since since we're right. continuing. Another 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 way another way another way to put it. You're saying that, that the drug de- drug dealer has a right to bear arms in order to protect themselves. Protect him, protect himself from other drug dealers who are doing equally illegal activities. That's what Absolutely. you're saying. Yes, because their that right flows from their humanity, not from the exercise or or compliance or willingness to comply or not comply There's with no some law. Thing as to you. That's a that's what a basic human right. Humanity. Wait a minute. What are these laws from humanity? Where are the, what are you making this up? Our unalienable rights. It's listed in the, no, no. In the Declaration it's be of Independence. By, hey, the only laws I know, pal are the laws on the books passed by a legislature. If you're going to start mm-hmm. making up laws and infinite in your mind, you can make up laws. Uh, Boy, so, where so, did you get that? Where did so, you get that comra- ability? C- c- comrade you Charlie. Make up laws? What, from philosophy? Can I, can I respond to you there, Comrade Charlie? <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll, tell, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you exactly where to find it. The Ninth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Because the Bill of Rights says that it specifies, right, that these are declaratory and restrictive statements. They are, they are made as further restrictions on the powers of the federal government. The Ninth Amendment says specifically that any rights here not enumerated are reserved to the people, that, it, the, the, um, that our rights are penumbra. We have all the rights in the world that you cannot measure the rights that human beings possess. What we are defining Brian, in our constitution Brian, is the limits of government lawyer. power. You know better. Not than the that. limits of our you rights. You know about Kate Brian, you're a lawyer. Okay. You know about case law. All right, before before we go any further, I'm gonna God. what are you playing dumb? I just told you the ninth amendment. No, go read you it. Know what, about, what, go read what, it what, what what does the ninth amendment say? All right, Nothing. I'll pull it up. So I can quote it exactly. On the bus. If, if he thinks there's a loophole, the loophole. What does the Ninth was, Amendment say? Just, just, just in, in summary, what does the Ninth Amendment okay. say? Because I'm not. So it says, that. um, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not yeah. be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. Right. So what that says is, and in our constitution is based on the limited enumerated powers of the federal government as defined in the, I don't know what article it is, but there's the duties of Congress. It defines the role and limits the role of Congress. It doesn't define the rights of the people. The rights of the repeat of the people are it, that nothing in the constitution shall disparage or deny us our rights, our unalienable right. rights as described in the declaration of independence. And it's, you know, yeah. I understand, comrade, Charlie, that you want to have authority over anyone to do anything that you want to them in order in service of the state, right? But that's not the way this country is set up. No, no, that's, that's not the point. Wait, wait, the point wait, wait, is wait a minute. It was set the up point, to establish point. law, rule, and regulation. That's why you set up a government. Now you're saying it's not. That's nonsensical. <laughs> The established government, and now you're saying, "What do you?" That would be nullified. All of the above, none of the above shall apply. Come on, I write contracts. You can't write a clause like that. None of the above have has any application. That's the way it's written, Charlie. No, it is not. It is absolutely no better. You are oh. a lawyer. Okay, so here's what I, here's what I here's what I know, Charlie. 
Here's what I know, is that almost every law that the federal government has passed has been passed under the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Under the duties of Congress, there's a clause that says that Congress shall have the power to regulate trade among the several states and the Indian nations. So the way that's been interpreted is everything is related to commerce. What isn't related to commerce? What can't you buy or sell? Everything. So, so, what, what, so what is that? So what is that? So what is that? The federal government's so powers that? are unlimited. So what does that have to do with anything? I mean, Charlie's asking for the the like. How did we exactly. wind up where we are? I'm telling him. <laughs> He's got no argument. It's, it it doesn't. It has, it has nothing to. It has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with availability of guns. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Not aware Wait, of those so, guns. which power of the federal government grants it is the, the, grants the federal government the authority to regulate firearms in any way whatsoever? Which is to which, oh. which of the regulate, well, powers? Well, well, the commerce, the commerce, the commerce clause. Sell, buying and selling guns is big business, so that should come under the co commerce clause of the commerce. That's what the government no. says. That is exactly what the government says. It's, they say they regulate it under the commerce clause. I mean, you can buy if you go into a gun shop. I'm told that you go into a gun shop. Gun shops, gun shops in most states do not have to have a business license or a tax ID number. Right. And, and so that's how the federal government has derived the power from the Constitution to regulate the sale of firearms is so because what does of the Commerce mean? Clause. Nothing. That means nothing. So they have the authority to enact legislation. And your question, who does it? That's up to the, the whoever puts together a piece of legislation. I mean, the executive office of the government, one of the three branches, executes the laws. That's right. why the agencies of the government that exists. What do you think they do? What do you think we did all day? Right. So, so to further restrict, right, statements of declaration, you know, declaratory statements and restrictive, restrictive statements are added in the Bill of Rights. And that is in the preamble to the Bill of Rights. Read the preamble to the Bill of Rights and you'll see yeah, what yeah. the first 10 amendments are meant to do. And so the second amendment, you know, as it's written, it, it declares that the, the federal government has th that the, the rights of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, right? The, the first part of that. This, state, uh, this under this, uh, this under this under this under the Second Amendment would have to do with states. Wait a minute. have to do states rights. But even if you take it as an individual right to to self-defense. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you have the right to stash 20 million guns in order to defend yourself. I thought you had to be in the militia. But, but yeah, it right. doesn't but, say individual. Right. So, it says in right. order to, to be served in the militia. Now, the, if the, the Constitution militia, says specifically shall not be infringed, right? It gives you weapons such as the National Guard of Illinois. At the, it's not weapons. the National Guard. You don't it's not the National to bring right. your own. And, what, and so my question is, if, if the Constitution reads the way it does, right, and they're deriving this power from the Commerce Clause, with that additional declaration and restrictive statement as added in the, the Bill of Rights, what by what power does the federal government derive the authority to regulate the, the people's state of right Illinois to keep and bear arms? has a National Guard with weapons. Yeah, you're off it's in the National the Guard land. I'm asking you by what authority so what does the federal government problem? derive it? Where does the federal government derive its authority to regulate firearms? Does not the state of Illinois have a National Guard that has weapons? Yeah. How, how, well, 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 let me let me state let me let me turn let me ask you the let question the other way does. around. Okay. Why, 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 okay. Let me let me let me let me let me let me ask you the question the other way around. Why should why shouldn't the state have the right to right to regulate weapons? Well, so I, I would say this that the states under the, the constitution, I would think the states yeah. would have the authority to regulate firearms within a certain um <clears throat> within certain parameters. The federal government I, you know, I think constitutionally, as the Constitution is written, I don't think the federal government has any legitimate authority to do that. But the Why? courts, Why? the courts Why? have said that it does. So I, I can't argue yeah. with the courts. I disagree with them. But why do you disagree with them? Because I believe that the right to keep and bear arms is is it unalienable that every person 
if you are not in state custody, right? Because if you're in state custody, possession of a firearm, certainly in that context, you are now a threat. To for, the for, 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 what, for what purpose? For the purpose of self-defense? Yes. Yeah, well, that, that argument, as I say, is being stretched to, stretched in an absurd way in, in states like Missouri and there are others like our, I think it was Missouri and others who are copying it, the Second Amendment Protect, Protection Act, which, as I say, a lot of police officers are opposed to because they feel that it ends up protecting criminals. Well, but that's the thing, right? You know, this use of the word "criminal," right? Let's not dehumanize people. Oh, okay, right? putting a label of a criminal. criminal on a cri- them, right? Okay, okay. Because okay. a lot the of things are crimes. The definition, the definition of a criminal is someone who's been convicted of a crime. If you don't okay. understand that, then we're talking about then we're talking two different languages. No, no, <laughs> and, and so, so what I'm saying is that someone who drives on a suspended license. Maybe they don't even know their license is suspended. Now they're looking at a felony, right? People, they, you know, they get out subject to some bond condition, right? If there's a, and then if they, they're they wind by, up- If they're stopped by a police, some of them could just get away with it. Okay, but, but what I'm saying is that, you know, this definition of who is a criminal, there are a lot of nonviolence acts that are criminal, right? So let's not dehumanize people. By oh, putting a label on. on them because they did something fucking okay. stupid. Okay, right? somebody, if somebody, if somebody, if somebody, if somebody, uh, somebody puts a, somebody takes a gun and points at my head, points it at my head and threatens me if I don't give them my wallet, they blow okay. my brain. Somebody, out. It's, somebody it's, doesn't it's pick up their, somebody <laughs> doesn't pick up their dog shit. Brian, Brian. I mean, like, you know, that's a crime, dude. Like, the thing is, there are so many things that are crimes that no one person could possibly know all of the things that could result in criminal sanction in this country. There are so many laws. So I'm a lawyer. Yeah, I can, all I can all I can all I can say is I'm glad that you're not you're not running for state's attorney because oh. I'd, I'd I'd be sure I'd be sure that I'd be I'd be sure of I'd be sure to keep oh, you no, from, no. from getting into the right office. Hey, and that's o- and that's okay. You know, my approach is not going to appeal everybody, but I will I will stand by my approach because because what I'm hearing from the the kind of more conservative elements, right? This get tough on crime. That is a tried and failed strategy. This has been going on for 30 years. Yeah, That's well, I don't think, we don't I, need I, we don't I, need to call I, out the I national think, guard. I, I, we need to call I, I, all I, I, the dogs. I, 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 right? Stop I, 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 criminalizing I, 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 everything. I, 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 Stop treating people I, 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 like they're not human I, 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 anymore. I don't think you have. I don't think you have a better. I don't think you have a better. I have a dumb question. How do we get from? How do we get from? How do we get from walkable cities? To gun control. <laughs> because you. we started talking Thank about you. crime. Brian, <laughs> Brian, I have a question. Uh, Do you uh, have a reference book you could recommend that I could look up the natural laws? What are the natural laws you referenced? And do you practice natural? Do you bring up natural laws in court? And what what are inalienable rights? Is there a list of these anywhere? I'll give you my email if you want. Could you send me a list of them? Uh, so, so what? And you what make these up as you go along. What would I need to provide to you to prove that I'm not state property? That you can't just take as much money I, if, I if you vote know. for somebody, right? That person could just take everything I have as long as as long as they took there, everybody's stuff away, it'd be fine, where right? Where are the natural laws? I'd want to look up one, two, three. Where are they? What are they? So how how much of my money are you entitled to? How much of my labor so you don't have do I owe to the book. state? You don't have a law book. There's not a law book. I've been in law libraries. I law. Charles, it's the life, not life not liberty, book. and pursuit of happiness. Those are our, our inalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And life means okay. that I've been able to protect my life. And, and that is an unalienable right, not given, can't be taken away. And when we That's start right. saying government criminals, right, this broad category of these thousands of crimes, most of which no one is harmed in the course of, so and we start law. taking away people's rights Wait a minute. and dehumanizing Wait a minute. them by labeling them oh, criminals. So, 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 Where's the case law on natural rights? It's Where right here. Cases? Okay, so what what do you what do you you say you say most you saying most you saying most crimes are nonviolent and and and, and, and don't Absolutely. they don't affect other people. Name 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 a few crimes 
Name a few crimes that don't actually uh, affect other people. Okay, so let's talk about scope of harm, right? So, so yeah. you breathe in oxygen, you blow out CO2. CO2 right. is causing deforestation. Your breath is harming me. You're killing me, right? So let's talk about the scope of harm and let's be realistic. About I mean, this, I, right? and this, 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 so that's absurd because I don't. Think, I understand. I don't, I don't, I don't think. Is, I don't think, it, I don't think anyone was. I don't think. I don't think anyone was ever arrested for breathing. Okay, but it is a factually true statement. And so by another person's very existence, they are harming the rest of life, right? Other than, you know, that other forms of life absorb what we breathe out. So when you talk about the drug war, right? The idea that uh, wait we're, a minute. we're taking are action because uh, we're afraid yeah. of what someone's going to do if they use cocaine, if they use crack, if they use that Oxycontin, if they use meth, if they use some angel dust, PCP, there are people, there are people thing, who can, like what's going to happen, there are people, right? Everybody's there are, like, there, what's going to happen are, in that there world? Are, there are people who commit violent crimes under the influence of drugs. How many people and, are and they do that, that while the drug war out. is raging? It's like they're they're doing it while this like the drug war is happening. No, and that's, still that's people beside are the, that's, it. That's, that's, that's beside the point. They do it because, in particular, with crack and cocaine and other uh, amphetamines, they, they they do it because of the way the drugs affect the brain. That's why they do it. Okay. Well, I mean, you're you're associating violence with the drug, and it's not necessarily that that there may be a correlation, and there may actually yeah, be and causation. And they do it. And they and they and they do it because and they do it because they're and they do it and they do it and they do it and they do it because they violent crimes. That may be so, but there are enough there are enough violent crimes that are committed by drug addicts. Okay. It's been and, documented. And and, 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 and part was, of it part of it too part of it too if they if they if 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 they run out of drugs, they get desperate, and then they uh, desperate, and if they don't have any money, they rob somebody in, in order to buy more drugs. Oh, oh, and all those things, I agree. I mean, you know, one hundred percent of what you said is true. And so, Brian, what I'm, Brian, what, uh, and so Brian, what I'm proposing you. to you is that it is a drug. It is the illegality, the black market, that creates that problem. Right, because oh, so the drugs you, are illegal. Okay, so okay, okay, wait, 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 wait. So, so, okay, so if you, okay, so if you, if you, if you, if you, if you legalize it, what's that? Then, what's that going to do to the price? And what does? I mean, look at the opioid addiction. The opioids are illegal. People, pe people, are, people get hooked on them, and then they get desperate. The more hooked on them, the more they need them. Yeah, just hold and, the liability laws up. You'd have no problem then. Get right. your guns legalized, you but hold up the liability laws. You'd be have no problem regulating them then. What do you mean the liability laws? How would that work? Ask Brian. So, so my well, proposal what is, is this, right? Is that yeah. if you decriminalize it, then you're able yeah. to tax it. And you can use that tax revenue for education, right? I don't, I, I agree. Drugs are a problem. Wait a I don't there, want there's to a, see there's drug a difference. Use there's, a, there's, a, the, there's a difference between de decriminal, decriminalization versus legalization. Decriminalization yeah. means that, you, that you're not arrested for using it, as, as opposed to legalization of it, which means that you turn it into, and you turn it into a, you turn it into just another consumer product. Yeah, that's the way they do it. Well, and I, I, I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree because then, then, been. yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm allergic to pot, so I stay clear. Away. I've never I never used pot with or without inhaling, as Bill Clinton once infamously put it. I'm I'm allergic to to, to marijuana, so I stay clear well, away. Just from try it. the edibles but, then. What? Try the edibles. I'm I'm allergic to it. I'm allergic to the substance. I don't want anything to do with it. But um, <laughs> no, no the... my the point is, point is, uh, marijuana is one thing. Marijuana is not an addictive drug. I'm talking about like crack and cocaine and other and heroin, which are very addictive. And people crave people get addicted to them and they crave them. Yeah. They run out of money, and what do they do to buy the stuff, even if it is legal? Yeah. What would you do if you de 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 uh, made tobacco illegal? Well, well, to, well to back let's say on let's say on the topic. So, now, so Brian, my proposal is this, Brian. Is that... Brian, I have a question. Now he brought it up 
if anybody pulls out a gun and shoots somebody, basically, regardless of the circumstances, they're going to face lawsuits uh, totaling and minimum. The legal costs are going to be around uh, the costs are going to be around a hundred thousand dollars. Are you claiming there's some sort of inalienable right? Yet people seemingly are finding a way that if they get shot, to take seek remedy from the person using the weapon. This seems rather contra now here's a total contradiction. You're claiming you have some omnibus universal inalienable right to use that gun. Yet if you shoot somebody, that person can come back and clean you out. So right. that the, way it the be? courts don't seem to think I, I'm the only thing I can conclude is you, in fact, don't have such an expansive right to that gun or to use it. Well, oh, all right, here. Here's the thing, Charlie, is that, you know, I have the right to swing my arms and kick my legs, but I don't have my right to swing my arms and kick my legs at someone else, right? I mean, it, it's like you're, you're equating a person you know, possessing the the right to defend themselves with the initiation of force, right? I mean, if you're pointing a weapon at someone and shooting them, you are initiating force. You're initiating violence. You don't have the right to initiate violence against someone else. And, and I think the issue is that, like, when you talk about taxation, you're initiating violence on somebody. I don't want you taking my money, but you know, you guys, no, no, big hey, schemes, wait a minute. Right? You figure out oh, I owe more taxes. Wait a minute. So you come take I'm my money to pay for your that schemes. Stuff, that libertarian nonsense, that government is violence. That, that, that doesn't go here. <laughs> that does not slide. We are not getting into George government Washington violence. himself no, said that. That is off the chart. No. George Washington, else. the government we is not, not eloquence. By, the government not is going violence. To allow that, George Washington. That the government is violence. Now you're George Washington. Get in trouble. You're going to get us in trouble. You're authorizing violence. And I'm not going to have that at the fucking college. So move on to something else. Okay. I don't know. I heard that before. All right. Now, now that now, is now. not allowed, pal. Okay. And okay, you know better. <clears throat> but, hey. now. Okay, Brian, we, this has been getting to be a good discussion. The government, that, well, that authorizing acts of violence. And we're not going to have that kind of talk. <laughs> so, hey, and, and I'll be very, very clear. As a libertarian, it is part of our, our pledge and the pledge I signed that, you know, we won't initiate force against other people. And that's like non-aggression is the basis of the libertarian philosophy. So, you know, non-initiation of force that is primary to everything that the Libertarian Party stands for. So, you know, I mean, I mean the thing is, you know, about people's unalienable rights is, is when you, if a person is released from state custody, they've served their sentence, they've done their time, right? They're rehabilitated, right. whatever the purpose of our criminal justice incarceration or jail system is, they've done their time, right? And upon leaving are they now are they no longer a free person have they lost because they made a mistake do we still believe in that pos that people that have people have the possibility to redeem themselves that they're worthy of of, of as oh, many yeah, chances yeah. in life as, as that they have oh, yeah. okay okay so i mean, you know and, and so to kind of parse it out to say you know and i'm not talking about you know nuclear missiles i'm not talking about f-15s you know like an ar-15 a semi-automatic rifle that is commonly held by americans right that is something that is you know part of our unalienable rights as individuals it is you know adopted in part of our culture so you know like felon non <laughs> like a felon can't get a gun yeah you can no problem i mean it's like to, you know to have these prohibitions to say you can't. Well, you're just setting him yeah. up to, to I've, I've, you know, commit no, another felony, I've, violation of parole standards or something. Yeah, well, <clears throat> giving up your right to, to own a firearm, that part, that's part of the punishment uh, that happens when you have used a, a gun in a crime. So I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. 
if you use a gun in a crime, like a violent crime, I agree with you because I believe that the Second Amendment is a political right. And that someone using a firearm in the commission of a violent crime to rob somebody, to, to harm them, to threaten them, that they're violating a political right that is one of our most honored in our American tradition. So yeah. you what know, do you when mean you by say political somebody right? using a gun in a violent crime, yeah. So hey, that, fuck it, stick so, yeah, so that so that that means so that means that even when they're out of prison, no, you don't get to have a gun again. You've already you had your chance to use a gun. And, or to have a gun and you used it as a, you know, uh, you know, as a, uh, an offensive weapon to, to rob somebody or something. So now you've lost your, you lost your right for your gun. As far as I'm concerned, that's part of the punishment. And, and then that, and then that again goes with the, um, you know, the uh, uh, cost and benefits criminals weigh in their mind when they're before they commit a crime. And they think to themselves, well, if I rob this bank, if I get caught, I'm never going to be able to legally own a firearm again. That's mm -hmm. part of that adds to their decision. So that's why that needs to still be in there. Once you, you once you commit a crime with a gun, that's it. No more guns for you. It's it's you're one and done. That's it. That and that and I'm good with that. I'm not buying the stuff that oh once you're not a once you're no longer you know uh, you know you're, uh, incarcerated now you can have a gun again. No. No, that's part of your punishment is that once you use a gun on a crime, then you can never have a gun again. And that that's that's I'm going with that. That's fine. I'm fine with that. So can I can I offer like a so there was a case with the Supreme Court where this guy, what he did was um, it was a it was a misdemeanor charge of domestic violence. Like he was in a fight with his girlfriend. She was coming up behind him and he like slammed the door behind himself and she like. She was injured in some way, right? So he was convicted and under the state law, he was now um, you know, prohibited from owning a firearm for the rest of his life. And, no, and if you no, talk that about would, like that's the second amendment is that, a political that's, that's, right. Well, that's that's not that's not what I'm talking about. Well, but but I'm even not saying any felony, I'm saying felony, you know, commission of a of a of an offense with a firearm, like you know, armed robbery, right. something like that. And, and, and to an extent, I agree with you, right, in, in principle, but as I think about in, the, in, in practicality and in implementation, right, how is that going to, how's that law going to be implemented? What power are you now giving the government? Because if you empower the government to say, okay, you know, whatever we define as violence, then, you know, we'll reserve the right to take your firearms away for the rest of your life because, you know, we some committee decided that what you did was violence. So Brian, uh, an act of violence is okay as long as it is not precipitated using a weapon? No, what I'm, what I'm saying is that if you say that is the an government- an act of violence to the victim, an act of violence. Is, is the person armed? An act of violence begins with uh, the initiation of force. Where it's is this unjust, unjust or you know disproportionate use of force. So, like to me, that's where All right. aggression. An takes act of violence. It's, okay, it's before we go, I'm going to stop. And under any circumstances, I'm sorry. In the work, in the in the labor law, any act of violence is immediate removal. There's no, and there's no middle ground. I'm sorry. I don't know where you guys are any, coming any, from. Any any the act, any act of violence. Believe you me, it is absolute. You are fired. It, oh, oh, you're fired. Okay. Well, so so let me so and, like and domestic violence. Say, so I'll ask you this: is domestic is domestic violence violence? An act, of violence, domestic is an violence, act of violence, man. Is domestic violence violence? Well, yeah, of course it's violence. What, okay. what else is it? So, so domestic violence is defined and it can include humiliation of um, your partner. Like if your partner you humiliates you in front of your friends, well, that could well, be considered but... domestic violence under the statute. The way the law is written, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, right? Intimidation of a dependent. 
deprivation of liberties, right? These things are considered domestic violence and they're very, what does, what do you mean? You know, so because when, when exactly. does your arguing employee, with your wife become, the, the become domestic abuse, your... right? Does it become Wait a emotional minute. abuse you're, you're well, or is it just you guys argue. having a fight, right? You're, you're saying I can argue that the employee should not be fired, even though he committed an act of violence, but no weapon was used. What employee? Like, Any could employee. A, a company fire its own employee? Yeah, but fire uh, for uh, anything. I don't care. Uh, I mean, uh, an employee is, is an employee. Yeah, they're they're subject to the, the to policies. Yeah, but in fire labor them. law, an act of violence is sufficient. And you're saying you're saying there's a type of binary system. There's there's acts of violence, which are just I guess by yourself. Oh, okay. And acts of violence. All right. So let me weapon. ask you. Let me ask you, Charlie. That's not. If valid. somebody humiliated you in front of your friends, would you consider that an act of violence? Well, earlier you told me that I got the idea that people who go jogging could be arrested <laughs> for using stealing air or something. So I'm a little. I don't know what where you're coming from legally. I, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you the definition of domestic abuse as written in the Illinois statute. It includes all these very, very broad well, the guy like, an like, act of emotional violence abuse, psychological abuse, violence, humiliation yes, no. in front of your friends. Like, I mean, it's like you and humiliate that, your wife in front, of your, of in front of her friends that is and you could be found guilty of domestic of violence. violence. Words okay, Mr. Zanarty, I have a question. Uh, what if this Everybody person who abuses us? Wait a minute, wait a minute. please. Words I have think. never been recognized in labor law as an act of violence. Nowhere in the, in the universe in answer to your <sighs> question. So, yes. In, in the Illinois domestic violence statutes, it is. Violence. I I'll, I can, I would be happy to show you. It's on the Illinois. Look no, at the Attorney General's website, and you'll see it. it, it humiliation. <coughs> it, humiliation. That is domestic violence. We're splitting hairs here. We're splitting hairs here. Okay, Mr. Denny, very quickly. Listen, uh, I understand what you're saying, and I'm applauding what you're saying, because I'm absolutely agree uh, with right now, let's praise what you said. I very much agree with what you said. And we have a couple attorney in our family as well. Anyhow, but what if this person, you know, who abuse another person emotionally and humiliate, what if this person uh, mentally sick? So, what, I mean, how people, you know, it's very controversial. How people are supposed to react, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's crazy if somebody abusing somebody in front of friends or acquaintances or, you know, you know, I'm in medical field. And sometimes I'm also uh, studying psychology. You know, let me tell you, sometimes it's, I mean, it's very controversial because listen by your own here like somebody abusing uh, somebody especially if they good like acquaintances let's say not friends mm -hmm. acquaintances or friends or relatives it's terrible it's humiliation it's reaction could be very very you know very anger and blah 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 but what if it's something do this person wrong mentally i mean what to do about it and you know you can Call 911 and definitely, you know, call to police and, and blah, 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 and report, blah, 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 whatever police decided. But sometimes police decided wrong or maybe right. And again, I'm asking you like attorney, how to react if, if you see a person incompetent mentally start to talk bazork or maybe they're on drugs, maybe they, yeah, I don't know. So tell me your opinion. I want to know. know. So I, I can't speak as an attorney, but I will I'll just say, right. I think as a society, mm -hmm. the issue is that we respond to those issues with right. police I'm agree. when I'm we agree. should respond with social workers or therapists, somebody who could help the situation and try to de-escalate. Yeah, yeah, but meanwhile, this person has emotional trauma. You know, who was abused know. by another crazy idiot or idiotka. Well, <laughs> 
So anyway, it's very controversial. It? So in other words, my, my opinion, uh, it depends by the circumstances, right? It depends by the situation. But uh, of course, for, for our own protection, better to phone to police and ask police for our protection sometimes, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's nice to hear opinion, you know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think on this note, we're going to probably um, stop the uh, right. stop the uh, recording tonight. We'll track the episode going on, and I think I'll, uh, I want to wish everybody thanks for watching tonight. I know some of us kind of got from a walkable city to a uh, debate on gun control. What a night. <laughs> I'm stretching it. Okay. Well, it's no longer safe. To, it's no longer safe to walk in, uh, you know, major blue cities. Hey, you know, under, uh, you know, I mean, I'm criticized as a political candidate, but under under my regime, and no one would interfere with your right to possess firearms. Yay! And be able to defend yourself. Yeah. Can, I, can I just apologize? To you? Wait a minute. Could I apologize to you, Brian, for yelling at you? Oh, don't worry about it, Comrade Charlie. Oh, I, you know, no, I, wait a minute. No, wait oh. a minute. The libertarians advance this government as violence. Oh. Unfortunately, some guy believed that, and I'm a federal employee, and I even have people from this facility working. <laughs> but some guy heard that, and he put together a bomb and blew up a federal building. And the militia groups are still out there. Now that kind of yep. talk doesn't go, doesn't fly, because the government is not violence. Matter of fact, the, the contrary is. We federal employees don't go around beating up people, arresting them, or anything like that. If I provided you a and, quote from George Washington, have, would it but change your mind? Some goofball, <laughs> and I think the Libertarian Party. I was shocked when I first heard this. I remember where I was. We had a little meeting after. The college at a coffee shop on Belmont pizza joint, and I heard you're, that you're for the talking, first time, and I thought it was talking. the most dangerous thing I had ever heard. Illogical, and the Libertarian Party should go back to your pals and tell them to get rid of. Unless you want to be um, some sort right. of militia group, Radiation. that's what they believe. Why? That the I don't understand. Violent, I don't, I don't, I don't. And they can go out and buy guns, and and then declare war. And that's what it has sadly happens. Well, well, well what happened? I'm, I'm not America. following you. This is this is this is what this is what the Libertarian Party advocated after yes, the say Timothy the government McVeigh. is violence, Jake. They say the government is violence. That's oh, not so they, and it's so they, so, 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 so the libertarian the so the libertarian party was was apologizing for Timothy McVeigh. No, no. And the Libertarian no. Party would never apologize. But they okay. precipitated. He, I mean, I don't he, know what Charles is thinking. This noise no. from, but, uh, you know, the, 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 we, we recognize the government as being uh, having the exclusive monopoly of force. And, and, and uh, unfortunately, it's not using it right now like it should be because the, the, the uh, um, really valid functions of government are police. Uh, armed forces and uh, the court system, and really everything—that's yeah. really all the government is. We really need to need them to do. The government is supposed to protect our rights. Government does not give us our rights; right. they protect our rights. Oh, and okay. The, yeah. the Libertarian Party it presents this picture that we're living in some horrible totalitarian state where people are apprehended on off the streets, which isn't true. But some idiot believes that. Some idiots believe that. Well, and that's why we so, get bomb threats. You know, we get, you know, in every telephone book in the federal government on the front page are things you're supposed to ask if you get a bomb threat. And everyone that's trained to search for bombs. That's what I mean. Get, the, get rid of that talk, please. Thank you. So, right. so in, you know, in, in you know, furtherance of the cause of liberty and, and the, the firm belief in freedom. Every libertarian has a different point of view on that stuff. You know, we try not to collectivize our thoughts, right? It's not like we're not one big collective mind. 
we all disagree amongst each other and, and accuse each other of not being a real libertarian all the time. So, you know, what's, what's important is this focus on, you know, the individual, because oftentimes in, in with the, the collectivized mindset, the individual is lost. Like, you know, what harm is done to individuals in the name of the greater good is often lost. So by focusing on the individual, we affirm the rights of everyone. <clears throat> Natural and unalienable rights. As, as defined in the US uh, Declaration of Independence, one of the greatest documents of all time, consent of the governed, consent, Charlie. All right, anyway, I think we've uh, covered everything on this issue until we're going. We should see you guys next week. Like I yeah, said- it's been I fun. I right. win, I uh, won. All right, I wish I speak <laughs> around. <laughs> Ellen, I hope you have a good I night. Win again. Bob, have a good night. Eliana, have a good night. Um, All right. Stop the recording now and uh, have a, uh, we're going to include this college. Yeah, take care, everyone. Know.